Okay, let's start. Questions? Questions? Okay, so um, uh, your current assignment, which was due yesterday, called for exceptions and, uh, and undo. And those of you who attempted the extra credit were supposed to learn that stuff on your own. So some of you may have actually gone and uh, uh, looked at exceptions. Um, so how many of you have actually s done some exception handling either through this assignment or before? Okay, some of you, okay? So hopefully you'll still learn something from here. From here. Um, so exceptions have to do with, um, we'll see how far we get into exceptions. And if we get far enough, you'll also learn about iterators if you don't know about iterators. Um, so exceptions have to do with error handling, right? I mean, that, that's, uh, that's kind of obvious from what, what you know about exceptions. Um, can we qualify a little bit more? So what, you know, exceptions, I'm going to take two classes, if not more. So we're going to spend some time on it. And, uh, you know, error handling, uh, you guys have been doing throughout the semester. So what is it that you need to know more um, to understand, error, to deal with error handling? And that is something that exceptions may be offering. So, uh, so let, let's look at errors first, uh, errors and mistakes. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, and mistakes are errors, so we can always go in that recursive way. But what kind of errors do you have when you write a program? If you were to classify them, how would you classify them? Maybe that will help us with exceptions. <laughs> Okay. So syntax errors, and those errors are caught when? Compile time, and exceptions would be errors that are caught at? Okay. So a little bit more we know. So these are runtime errors. Can we classify run, runtime errors into different kinds of errors? Austin? Okay. So we can type errors, and we can say array index out of bounds exception, null pointer exception. So exceptions seem to be typed things, and types implies classes and or interfaces. So exceptions, in fact, are classes. Okay? That's how Java designed it. Java did not make them have interfaces. We can have in our exceptions interfaces, uh, but the ones it defines uh, don't have interfaces. Okay? So these are classes. And can we divide these types of exceptions into category? And, and that's, that's exceptions, okay? So let's not get into exceptions too quickly. Let's just talk about errors in general, okay? So errors can be runtime errors and compile time errors. Compile time, uh, runtime errors are what have to do with exceptions. But let's just, just go back to errors in any language. Um, and they can be different kinds of er errors, but can you classify these various kinds into even broader categories? Think of your program. What kind of errors have you had to deal with that manifest themselves at runtime? Uh, Andrew? Okay, so you can say recoverable or unrecoverable errors. So if you get a null pointer exception, is that something you could recover from? No? Uh, okay. Uh, recover meaning what? Once it's a, a, a recover means at runtime or change it later? Okay, so. Uh, uh, recoverable could be that while the program is executing, you recover from it, or it could mean that you could go and avoid it in the next iteration. Okay, so null point errors are probably errors you could avoid in the next iteration, but in that particular run, uh, execution, you probably couldn't recover from it. During. Okay, so that's kind of recoverable versus non-recoverable. So recoverable errors are errors probably that cause some output, maybe even an error message. And unrecoverable errors are ones that you throw up your hands. And if you throw up your hands, how does the program executor, the TA, know you have an error? They get some kind of message. Okay, so they can be errors that the programmer handles and errors that you lead, that you 
go and let the, uh, you, the programmer does nothing with. And then the, the, when the programmer handles the errors, they could recover from it, and or they may not recover from it. Okay? Um, let's talk about fault finding. So the errors could be caused by whose fault it is when there are errors in the program. The programmers, or it could be somebody else's fault also. The programmer, and who's the other? Uh, Austin, who's the other? The end user. And have you seen those errors? Your, they, they enter the wrong token. They may enter, and I keep telling you guys that don't, don't even worry about that. Okay? But in general, the user could be causing the error. So there could be an error in the program. Or there could be some external agent that caused the error. The external agent could be a user. Or in this world of, uh, what else could the external agent be besides the program and the user? So you're running one JVM, you're running one program. That program may not be at error. The user may not be at error. Sorry? Okay, so the operating system, that could crash or the hardware could crash. Okay, things you trust. Any other, with it? Any other program that's interacting with it. In this world of internet computing, does that happen? A lot. Okay, so, so this program has been written to accept some format of data from the end user, some format of data from another program. So that's an external error. Okay, that's going to be very important in the design of exceptions. Okay, so um, exceptions have to do with error handling. They have to do with custom error handling. That you know, you don't just throw up your hands. Maybe you go and give a nice error message, or maybe you even recover from it. Okay? And the error kinds could be internal errors, okay, off by one. Okay, so you're going through a loop and you don't know whether to terminate at length minus one or length or length minus two sometimes. So you, you, you have these, you know, these errors you, uh, you get quite often, or external errors, which could be user input, fi file system, okay? So one program could have written to a file that another program is reading from, okay? And that could cause an error, okay? You'd ask Microsoft Word to go and open uh, some, some file it doesn't understand, a Java file, well, it can actually open a Java file, uh, but that may cause problems, okay? Other distributed programs. So, uh, you know, I've taken a very casual approach towards errors in some sense in this course, right? I mean, when are we doing exception handling? The last week of class almost, right? And I keep telling you guys, uh, don't worry about errors. When I do the, when I do the uh, um, code in class, I just don't even talk about errors. Um, so how important is error handling? I seem to be implying it's not important, right? Yet I didn't quite let you go without covering error handling. So, yeah. But some programs that can be used for hugely important things, like I can think of it like plane, for example, and some programs that don't get errors in that, which plane is a little like trash. So, some programs you want to catch errors in, right? The plane, right? Whereas Microsoft Word, who cares? You just lose 10 days of work or one day of work, or I don't know, you know? Uh, how much does Microsoft Word cost? How much does a plane cost? Okay, so, uh, you know, when people complain about Microsoft, you know, you have to see what you get. But uh, this is, there's an interesting, uh, I don't know if this is a true story or not. A bunch of software engineers were asked, uh, how many of you would be willing to enter a plane if you knew that you had written the software for it? <laughs> uh, how many of you would, would do it? So one person said yes. And the rest of the people said, oh, you're very confident. He said, if I wrote the program, the plane wouldn't even take off. <laughs> so, so yes, you know, I mean, those guys really, really have to worry about a lot. Uh, but what about, you know, what about a good old program that you write, a word? Uh, sure, the user may get annoyed, they may lose work. What else could go wrong if that er uh, program is erroneous? Something really bad. They can use system resources, and, and so that will just waste time. Could it be even worse than that? A lot of security problems are caused by errors. A lot of security problems are caused by errors. Okay? 
when something bad happens, when the user enters something bad, you just, you just assume it doesn't happen, right? Well, what, you, what might you do, especially if the language is not very good? The user may enter a long string, and you, are just, you just allocated this much space for it, and the user has entered this long a string. Ideally, the language should go and catch and say, okay, this won't fit in this array, but some languages are very blasé about things and say, oh, you know, we'll just go over the array and go to the next array and write it down there and go to the next array and get the next data structure. And this, the, the, the hacker can go and write interesting things into your memory and then maybe even execute that stuff as code. So what they entered was some code that the program executes and a lot of security problems occur in there. Okay? So, um, uh, so some people like, uh, you know, so I, when I was, at, I was at Purdue at one time, and my, one of my, uh, I just uh, grade operating system exams, and the two of us would grade the same exam, and one of them was a security person, and I wasn't. So I would look for the general case, and you say, oh, they didn't get the error, error case, so what, 5% off. He would only look at the error case, and he wouldn't even look at the other stuff, and he said, you know, that would cause a crash. So, you know, it's different outlooks, and security people really, really care about the error. Okay? So it is important even though we are looking at it at the end, okay? And you want to study more about this stuff, you know, do take security courses, and we have excellent faculty members in security here also. Okay. So, <clears throat> error handling is important, okay? But we have gone through this whole semester without studying exceptions, and some of you have done the extra credit that required you to go and look at scanning errors and parsing errors. And you've, most of you have, who've done that part have done it without exceptions, okay? A lot of languages do not have exceptions. Yet, people who write in those languages do error handling. So now we are going to tie error handling to exceptions in Java. Um, what do you need to know more or what have you missed when you were doing error handling um, that could be better through language design? And if you know exceptions, you know, you can obviously use your knowledge of exceptions. So why have something special, some special concept called exceptions to do error handling? You've got ifs, you've got print, prints, you can do anything, you know, with, without exception handling. So what, you know, what are we going to gain by having this special concept of exception? Because we'll see there's a lot of rules here. Andrew? So you're saying that you might want to react to different kinds of errors or dif in different places? So you want to handle different kinds of ex errors differently, right? Yeah. And if I didn't have exceptions, I couldn't have typed errors. Is, did you, were you going to raise your hand? Yeah. Okay, so whatever Java does provide, and, and you are familiar with some of that, you think that is easier to read than if statements. And Andrew's example thing is that we need types of errors. So that's good. I mean, exceptions could be just these type, type classes, right? So we want to distinguish between null pointer exception and, and, and um, array index out of bounds exception. And rather than defining, our, defining, if I didn't have types in a language to describe these exceptions, what, what else might I have? Have you guys dealt with some other language that classified exceptions based on some other criteria other than types? Have you ever seen an error message from the system saying something bad happened and they indicate what happened, the bad by not a name but by a code? Have you seen that? Yeah, Windows does that all the time. It does? Okay, I guess it does. Uh, it still does? It used to, okay. What else does it, Windows do when something really bad happens? Blue screen and data. Blue screen. Anybody programmed in C? What is the equivalent of blue screen in C? Fault. And you get, you, and when there's a fault, what, what kind of aids does C give you? A core dump. It says, here's the whole memory, you figure out. And I mean, you know, that's what people did. Okay. 
So the first time I saw the core dump in C, I, I told my partner, you program, I'll just watch you program, you know. <laughs> so it was not a pleasant experience. Uh, so, there's, so rather than having these codes, it could have nice names, and these names could be types, okay? So that's one thing we get. We get these types from exceptions, and we get these try-catches that you seem to be familiar with, and those happen to, and you're saying they're easy to read than if-else. So uh, that may be true. Um, anything else that you guys, yeah, Andrew? Also, if you get to an exception, then if you can have it, so it won't run any other code that relies on whatever through that exception. So if you get an all-pointer, it means it won't try to access the other thing that takes access to that thing, thing that happens to be null, you have an entry try in there. Okay, I'm not sure I followed that. So you're Okay, so we know that when we did scanning errors, okay, so when the user had an illegal token, you could kind of recover from that, right? You could go to the next token. But when you, it came, when you have a parsing exception, the moment you have the first error, you're going to get a cascade of errors after that because who knows what's going to happen afterwards. And the similar thing, that once you get a null pointer exception or you get this IO exception, you probably don't want to go any further, okay? Because who knows what, what bad things are going to happen. And, and we don't want let this, to let this person go and input stuff into your memory and cause havoc. Okay? So there's a, there's a notion of type exception. There's a notion of this, some other construct rather than if, if then, which is um, try catch. And there's a notion of stopping execution and not going any further in some scope and saying, look, we are not going to, th th this is just going to be dangerous to execute afterwards. Okay? So you guys are getting a lot of that stuff. So error handling can be done without exceptions. And, you know, when you said it's easy to read, you're getting into software engineering principles, okay? And besides readability, what other software engineering principles are there? If I was to, I was to ask you in the midterm, enumerate all the things you've learned, give them names, the software engineering principles. Um, you might say readability and... Sorry? Reuse. Reuse. And reuse comes from... And, 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 yeah. Modularity, and modularity is separation of? Concerns. So separation of concerns is sort of a, more, a broader principle, and modularity is the one way to do it. And uh, um, these programs that, that, don't, that dump code typically, they, they don't dump code because the, program des the language designers didn't know better. The language designers was try were trying to go and make efficient programs. Think programs that really ran fast. C is what you use to make things run fast. And, and fast is a, goal, is a good software engineering goal also, okay? So you want easier to program somehow. You want efficiency. That's a good goal, and, and it, it, it's a trade-off sometimes. Sometimes what is easier to program is not very efficient. Okay, if you programmed in machine language, it'd be more efficient uh, if you were a really good programmer, okay? Um, and and uh, so you want to try to have both of these goals you want separation of concerns. And what could error handling and separation of concerns have to do with each other? I mean, why, why am I talking about separation of concerns in the context of error handling? What are the concerns? Yeah. So the thing is that errors is another concern. And you might want the error concern and the non-error concern to be separated. So that when I grade the students' ex exams, I can just look at the non-error part, and my security expert can look at the erroneous part. Okay? And that's why I've not done errors before, because it, you know, there were too many things I had to... I was trying to focus on something else other than errors. So I focused on that rather than errors, and now we'll just talk about errors. Okay? So non-erroneous code and erroneous code, and that is why perhaps these try catches are easier to read than than the if then else. Okay. Okay. So we'll take almost the simplest possible program and dissect it to death now using our error checking hat, the security hat. Okay. 
So um, what could go wrong in this program? The user does not provide an argument, right? And we know how the arguments are provided. And if we don't do that, we'll, we'll get, if, if we provide the argument, this is what we'll get. We'll get hello world printed out. Okay. Can you guys see the bottom, by the way, from, from the back? Can you, you guys can also see? <coughs> okay, so if the user does not provide an argument, given that program we had earlier, what do you think is going to happen on the screen? What will you see on the screen? Are you going to see a blue screen? No. So, uh, so you, an error was made. When an error is made, what, and the program is not handling it, the question is, what is the default handling? Okay, so the default handling is A, that it will tell you the kind of exception, and B, it will exit the program, and C, <laughs> where the error is, and it will tell you which line it occurred in that main method, and will it tell you something else also, besides where it occurred, in which procedure, yeah. It will give you the whole stack, okay. So it will tell you these three things, and what exactly is the error that occurs, is it a null pointer exception, or is there some other kind of exception? <coughs> Let's look at here again. So if the user does not provide an argument, what goes wrong? Andrew? Array index out of bounds. Array index out of bounds. There will be an args. That args will have length of zero. Okay? So if there was no args, it would be a null pointer exception. But here we would get, um, so we get a type of exception, which is array index. We, tell, we get to see the line also. And we get the trace of all methods in the call chain. Or the call chain is the stack. So we'll see those two things. This is the default handling. Okay, so without teaching you exceptions, by you just writing programs and Java dealing with the exceptions, you get some error message. Okay, now you can look at this and say the glass is half full. And the glass is half full. This is an excellent error report because what is what is the bad thing that could what what how could the error message be worse than this? None. Okay, that's, that's one interesting thing. That, that it silently goes and fails. Doesn't even tell you something bad happened. Better than that is the core dump. And the core dump, what, how, how do you get the core dump? You get the core dump not in, when the error occurred, much later. Okay, because that error caused another co error, caused another error, and finally there was an illegal access. So what really happens is that when you go and say arg0, what does Java really do? Uh, Java says, okay, I know the location of args, the array. Now you're going in subscripting the array. I know you're going to the zeroth element or the first element or the nth element. It goes and adds an offset to where args is stored. And it goes and tries to access that. Okay, that's what it does. So these other languages like C just do that. They say, okay, we assume you, 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 you know what you're doing. You went and said args5, I'll just go to the, the fifth word following args, okay? And no error message. Whereas the fact that Java did this means that Java was actually being very slow. It was doing, not very slow, but it was doing what's called subscript checking. Every time you go and access an array element, it goes and says, are you within bounds or have you gone beyond the bounds? And that is why it's harder to go and make Java programs fail in a bad way by, the, by, by hackers rather than C programs, okay? So um, I spent some time in Microsoft, and while I was there, they had this big push on trustworthy computing, and, and basically it meant that replace C with C Sharp, and C Sharp is sort of a nicer version of Java, okay? It came after Java, so it cleaned up a little bit more. It's got getters and setters built into the language, and you can't go wrong in the syntax there. And, and uh, they did it for all parts. I was sitting with the operating system group, and that group was revolting because they wanted to make things efficient. And so, you know, the kernel group did C, uh, program in, in, in C. 
So, um, but C sharp like Java will do this subscript checking. Okay, and that's why you got this error. You got this error because there was extra checks put in by by the language saying, "Have you gone out of bounds?" The bounds that were expected. Okay, so that's your glass half full approach. The glass half empty. What's really bad about these error messages? So they, they, they're okay for the programmer when they're debugging, but the end user, they didn't enter an argument that says array index out of bounds exception. Are they going to go and find the run configuration and enter the argument? Okay. So understandable to the programmer, but not user. Okay. So that's what's wrong. And is write a better program, the programmer, and can say if args.length is zero, then specify a message and we can exit the program. Our program is not being graded by the grader program, so we can use the exit statement here. And uh, okay, no exception. We didn't have, as programmers, have to know about exceptions. We just wrote this program. How can you fault this program now? Okay, so now let's go and put up. We all said very abstractly here are the advantages of doing exception handling. In this concrete program, tell me what I'm doing. Tell me why this is not the best solution. Zach? <coughs> Sorry? Okay, so you're saying that maybe print line, if uh, that that the error may not be printable by print line. As it turns out, everybody relies on two string. Print line does, Java does, so that's not, you know, that's not quite the answer, Zach. You'll get the error message if you add five, six, seven arguments, anything more than one. Okay, so you're, you're faulting, uh, okay, so you're saying you could do better, better error checking. Yeah. You could check if arg's length uh, is not equal to one. Okay, let's assume that's a feature. That we let you enter five arguments and we just print the first one. Okay, that's true. But given the error that I am checking, is there a better way to do the same error reporting? Let's just, you know, there I'm not, I'm not even checking for that particular error. Uh, Andrew? It, it checks if there's any error that doesn't have to do it and then only handling the error if it is actually a problem. So you're saying it checks for the error first and, and it does the correct thing later. Should we have, you're saying should we have reversed that? Should we have done the proper thing? The expected thing first and the unexpected thing later, is that what you're saying is the fault here? It checks the air condition before it does the execution. So it's checking the error before it does the execution. So in try catch, the check has to be made one way or the other before, before you execute the code, right? The question is. Does the erroneous code come first, error handling code come first, or does the non-error handling code come first? And you're saying with try catch, the non-erroneous code comes first, and here the erroneous code, the error handling code come first. Does that make it less readable somehow? So you have to look to find which the error part is, which is non-error part. In this if, you have to see that, oh, the then part is the erroneous error handling part, and the else part is the non-error part. So I, as somebody who doesn't care about errors, have to look at every if to figure out which part should I look at. To, to, to look at. On top of that, this is expecting an argument. So you pass an empty string, now you can do another check. Okay, so you're saying that one, but you know, the, the checks, so, so you, again, with like Zach, you're complaining that I'm not doing enough error checking. Okay. Look, I'm doing some error checking. Given my view for philosophy, that's pretty good. <laughs> okay? Uh, if you wanted to change how exactly the program takes the error and that's what it's like Okay, so you might have an if, else, if, else, 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 and you've got to go through all the else's to figure out which one I'm interested in. 
Okay, that, we've got that. Okay, that's good. That's excellent. What about efficiency? Is this program slower or faster than the program I wrote earlier? Why is it slower? Because I'm doing this checking. And I'm doing this extra checking. Java already is checking here. This is, you know, it's checking. Whenever you do arg0, Java has put some code that's compiled that goes and checks whether the value is within bounds or not. That is why you got that exception earlier. We are doing the check twice. That's very important. Okay? So through exception handling, not only will we get something that's more high level, easier to program, but also something is more efficient. That doesn't happen very often, by the way. Huh? You have your cake and eat it too. You, you get both programmability and efficiency by what we'll do. Okay? So this is not what we want, ideally. Okay? So we've got this part, we've got this part. One part is the error handling code, the other is the non-error handling code. And we don't know, you know, this undifferentiated for the reader. Like all of you have, you know, you sort of have latched onto that and agree with it. And you may want to ignore errors on first pass, or you may want to only look at errors on first pass, you know, depending on who you are. And Java checks for subscript error already compiled code, and we are doing the check again. Okay? So these are all the problems that we want to solve through something new, a new kind of construct, and that construct we are going to call, uh, okay? And, uh, you know, this, this code for many of you is not foreign, and even for the rest of you, I threw the stuff in in the very first day or second day of class saying, let's try catch, and this is kind of how it works. Uh, let's try to dissect this and understand it better. So I've got two parts here. Clearly, this part is the part that, is, that, that assumes no errors. And this is the part that handles errors. Okay? And we've got these curly braces here to separate the first part from the second part. Okay? Now, why the word try before this piece of code? Austin? So when you write your code, you have different degrees of confidence about what you're writing, right? And try means, you know, I'm really not sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's not committing to it, then you can recover from a potential error. So you're just saying, okay, I can certainly walk on this, you know, big surface, but you ask me to walk a tight rope, and I'll say, I'll try. And yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so you're telling me now why this is good. First, I'm looking at the syntax, okay? And then we're getting to the semantic, which is the more interesting part, okay? So try means, look, look, I'm doing something that is full, potentially full of errors, and I might fail, okay? I might fall down. And if I fall, I want a safety net, okay? So you are not doing just this ordinary walking. You're walking with a safety net, and this is your safety net. Okay, that's sort of the analogy. That's something to catch you. Okay? So this is the try, this is the catch, and this is, okay, this is the analogy. Okay, now, now the semantics. So are we doing uh, less error checking now? Are we, uh, did we get, so did we, okay, we, we went and separated the erroneous error, uh, error free code from the error handling code. All right, so that we got that. How did we get uh, performance? <coughs> okay, so basically what you're doing is you're saying, Java, let's go and cooperate on this checking. I know you do checking, right? That's how I got this exception. When you do the checking and you find something wrong, don't decide on how you're going to handle it. You just do the detection, I will do the handling, okay? And when I do the handling, please tell me what kind of error you got because you, you're good at catching all kinds of errors. You'll catch null pointer exception, you'll catch error index or bond exception. I want you to just go and worry about detection. Handling, I will do in a custom way because in my case, this array index or bond exception means that my end user did not go and do, do, do the right value. So I would go and report a proper message and I will use your handling to do that, okay? 
That's what it really means. That I've caught your error. Okay? And some, something about the error is, is indicated in this particular variable, which we are not even looking at right now. We kind of know that's, uh, that, what, what the context is, so we don't bother to look at this value. Okay, questions? This one just goes, you know, with rose-tinted glasses. Everything will go fine. And that's what you do in this. It assumes, here you put on the hat which assumes that everything will be fine. Here you put on the hat which says, oh, something could go wrong. So errors can happen here. You're just not bothering about that. So try catch separates regular and error handling code. No extra subscript check. Okay, that's very important. Exception handling, uh, exceptions really make your program fast. Okay, that was a very simple program. Let's try to make the program a little bit more complex, okay, to show the complexity of exception handling. So now I'm entering in my argument not a string to be echoed, but the number of strings that are to be echoed. And the strings that are to be echoed will be entered on the console. Okay? So we are going to bring in two forms of input. One is in, from, the, from, uh, from the argument, the other is from the engines. Okay? So I said, uh, I ran the program, I said I'm going to give you two arguments, and then I gave it the first argument, for, uh, I'm going to give you two strings, and then I gave it one string and it echoed it back. I gave it another string and it echoed it back, and since it expected only two strings, after the two strings, it went and terminated. Okay, that's my program. The goal is that you enter this number, and then you go and enter so many lines. Um, what all could go wrong here? This is my complex, Andrew? Okay, you could give a negative number, or you could give, could you, you, did, do you have to even give a number? You could write hello world here. Do, and, and, and you may not even give an argument, right? And supposing you have, okay, so errors, user may enter no argument, user, may, and, uh, user argument may be a non-positive, I should have said a non-natural, uh, natural numbers include zero, I keep forgetting. A non I, I guess, do you guys remember? You, so natural numbers are one to one or more or zero or more? Oh, really? That's why I'm confused. <laughs> okay. So I, I mean a positive number. And um, so I may not do that. Anything else that can go wrong after that? I've entered two. <clears throat> okay. So that's, that's interesting. Let's go and handle the easier case first. What if I try to enter three strings? I'll enter the first string. I'll enter the second string. It's terminated. So what will happen in Eclipse if I start trying to enter the third string? It will, I, actually, I checked it this morning. I didn't know which way it was going to go. It won't even let you enter. If the program is terminated, you can't enter anything into the console. Okay? So, may enter more than n lines? Not really. You can't do it. Okay? User may enter less than n lines. Now, this is going to be the interesting case. If, if, uh, if the user enters one line and doesn't do anything after that, as Zach was suggesting, the program is just going to wait. Is it possible for the user to tell the program, I'm done, without entering some minus one or dot or something. Just tell in general, I'm done with input. Have you guys, anybody seen this in perhaps another context? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, so that's between you and the program, right? We go and tell the program, if I enter dot, I'm done. Is there a way for a user to just tell the program, I'm done with input in a very general way? You could terminate the program, but then the program is also terminated, right? So can the user terminate input without, the, without terminating the program? 
As it turns out, uh, I'll give you a hint. Reading from the console and reading from a file are, are considered identical, basically. From the program's point of view, there's no difference. One is a stream that comes from the input, another is a stream that comes from a file. At an abstract level, they're all streams. Supposing that program was reading from a file, and you didn't put a minus one, you didn't put a dot. How does a program get to know that the file, that the input is over? So there is in every file an end of file mark. And when the program tries to read that, it gets to know there's end of file. And so the, what program does it, 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 it keeps reading till it gets end of file. There is an end of file in console also. Okay, uh, uh, and uh, I don't know how to do it in the wind. Uh, it depends on the operating system and the programming environment. I don't know how you do it quite, uh, quite um, 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 uh, on the Windows machine at least. But in Unix, which is the machine I grew up with, you would do Control D. So the user would enter things and then they would go do Control D and that was equivalent to putting an end of file mark. Okay, so Java is ready for a control D, even though I don't know what it calls control D. I haven't been able to Google or figure out what it does, okay? So that is yet another error that can occur, that the user might go and say, hello world, and then control and end a file, and the poor program doesn't, hasn't got its input that it expected, okay? So lots of things that can go wrong here, okay? Okay. So user may enter less than n lines and then enter the EOF or end of file character. And maybe Java doesn't even allow it, you know, because I haven't found a way to do it. But in general, in languages, that is something that, uh, that, that users can do. Okay, so what we'll do is, just to make, so things have become, become more interesting because there are more kinds of errors. But that's not the only reason why they become interesting. We're going to make things more interesting because this is a more complex program. And we're not going to do all the work in one main method. We're going to have the main method called two different methods. And then the question becomes, whose responsibility is it to do the errors? That is where a lot of issues arise in exception handling. That we decide that we're going to do error handling. We've divided the program into multiple modules or multiple methods. And the question is, which unit should do error handling? Okay. Uh, if you call a method, does the called method handle the errors it detects? Or does maybe the, call, the calling method handle the error that it's the called method detected? Okay, just as you can handle the errors that Java detected, a calling method can maybe d handle the error that a called method detected, and how to go and have, have it always. That makes sense, okay? So my program is the following. There's a dot, dot, dot here, means that I haven't told you everything. But my main method is all, all, of these, all of these methods are going to be static methods in one class right now, just so that I can use less space, okay? No, I'm not gonna use instance methods in different classes. So my main method is going to go and first call number of input lines. Number of input lines is going to go and look at the args, go what, do whatever it needs to do to return back a number that says how many lines are to be input. The, that number is going to be given to echo lines, which is going to read input with, and, and, read, and try to read that many lines of input. Okay? So the, the division responsibilities, there's a main method, there's the echo lines method, there's a number of input lines method, and now we've got to figure out how do we distribute error handling among these three methods? Okay. And, and at least the function of these methods, no, no problems? Yeah. Is there a way to have two consoles acting on the same program? Can you have two consoles for the same program? Uh, there's only one console. Okay. Uh, what you can do and, uh, is try to create your own windows that behave like consoles, but otherwise there's only one. And why might you do that? Can you imagine having more than one console for a program? You think it'll cause problems or solve problems? It's kind of like Hang on. When you have threads, do you want one console or multiple consoles? You're saying it's like threads. Threads are threads are so threads. Are, No, but if I have two different consoles, I've, I've said this is your... Imagine having one thread running in one console, another thread running in another console. That would be good, right? They won't get intermixed. 
So in fact, I've added some facility to object editor that lets you go and output different things into two different um, console-like things. They behave like consoles. They're just something I created using object editor. Okay, so that's actually something I really miss. Um, in fact, in, in Java, I can have a distributed program. I can have five JVMs running in the same Eclipse environment, and they all share one area. Even though they're different consoles, they share one console area. So again, you want sort of separate consoles. Okay, but in general, there's one console. Okay, that's called the standard input. It's both the standard input and the standard output. Okay, and you can always substitute the standard input with a file and the standard output with a file without the program even knowing about it. Okay, anybody done that with Unix or Linux? Just read, input redirection, you guys? Okay, I'm, I'm getting off topic here, but that's something you can do. Okay, so I'm just, uh, okay, but let's not complicate the problem too much. So we have our main method that does this. Any questions? Further questions about this? Okay. And my number of input lines is going to do this integer.pass in arg0. It assumes that everything goes perfectly. That's what goes into the try block. And then it catches one of the possible exceptions, which is the array index out of bounds exception. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm telling you this is not a good idea. So, uh, why? Uh, it's not catching number format exception. So, don't give me a hard time about that. I'm not doing it because I'm preserving space. Okay? So, I'm only catching one of the exceptions, and let's say that's acceptable. I wrote this function. Can you guys see what's wrong with this function? Andrew? If you get an error, it won't return anything. It won't even compile. Remember, if you have a function and you go and have if, then, if, and else, if you return a value in the then part but not in the else part, Java complains and says, I want every possible path that this function takes to return a value. And you have taken a path that doesn't return a value. Okay? So I'm this number of input lines function. I did pretty good. I went and gave it, gave an argument. And what should I do then? How can I fix this function? How can I make it compile? And? Okay, I could just, so ignoring number format exception, uh, I can have multiple catch blocks for number format. What's the return value? I could just return zero. Okay. Okay, I'm, the, the return value happens to be an int. <coughs> so I return zero. Supposing I could have returned now, would that be somehow better than returning zero? Andrew? Yeah. Okay, so if I somehow enter null, I'm, I'm just passing the buck. And the caller has to go and worry about it, but at least the caller knows something bad happened. But then it has to worry. I mean, you have the advantage of minus the system that I've done personally, this being identical to the user banking, um, typing in zero. If you somehow manage to return null, you'd at least have this specific, like, a runtime. Okay, so if, if, we, if we could return null, and if null was an illegal value, null is sometimes a legal value, by the way. I mean, it just means that, okay, I, I, I didn't find anything. Remember when we were doing the match title of a course, we returned a null course when we couldn't find anything. That was, that was fine, you know, that was, that was allowed. So at least um, the, 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 program, the, the person calling knows that there was an error, okay? So we have a little trade-off to make. The called method can handle the error and make the caller oblivious of, the, of whether the error occurred or not. Or the called method can, that's how we, what we've done here, and, and the called method has just unilaterally made a decision to return zero. 
if that decision was always going to be correct, no matter who called it, why tell the caller about it? But in general, you can imagine that the called method may not be able to decide without context that how to handle the error. And in this case, the, pro the user wrote, ran the program, right? The user forgot to enter an argument. Is zero a good value really for that? Yeah, I mean, what did they achieve? Give them at least one, maybe even two. But just pick a value, and, and it seems like one would be better than nothing, and who knows what the right value is. But this poor number of input lines doesn't have enough context. It has enough to go and do the job. It doesn't have enough context to go and figure out how to handle it. Sometimes it, the called method will have, sometimes the called method will not. Because we want to go both ways, we'll complicate our life by, 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 by making exception handling even more complex. Okay? So, firstly, we have now done error recovery. We just didn't report errors. We are returning a value. Okay? That's interesting. We talked about error recovery earlier. Here we have recovered from the error. Okay? And the call error function may want to assume one instead of zero. And the problem is that we have prematurely decided how to recover. Okay, and, and the caller, in this case, sometimes the caller doesn't have to do it. In this case, maybe the caller should decide what to do. Okay, and now we are stuck with this problem. We can't return null because null is not an int value. Even if I changed int, int to integer, null may be an acceptable, null val uh, acceptable value. So how do I go and tell my caller uh, something bad happened. Is that? In this case, negative numbers aren't acceptable, so you can just return negative one. So I could return negative one in this case, right? But sometimes, I mean, let's talk generally. In general, the range of values I can return may all be legal. In general. You know, I, in some languages, I forget, in Java, is there something called unsigned? Is there a type called unsigned? You, in C, there is, which, which says basically unsigned numbers, okay? So you don't even allocate an extra bit for the sign. And in that case, I'm stuck, okay? Or I might be an opt null, maybe a legal value, or this might be a Boolean value, and what do I do in that case? So uh, what should I do? I want, to, I want to not just terminate the program. I want my caller to handle this. Yeah. So I write, make the caller do the try catch. That means I, and what would I do then? Okay, but I can't return null. I could throw another exception. Okay. So we haven't seen that. So far, exceptions are thrown magically by the system. Now we could perhaps throw exceptions too. That's a, that's a great concept. And if, we, if I throw an exception here, then my caller has to catch it. Okay? And um, could it be, could I, so we, we, we've understood the basic concept. As Fred tried to indicate that I want the caller to have the catch block. If I throw an exception, the caller would have a catch block. Is there something... Could I make the caller have a catch block by doing less work than throwing an exception? Because what, you know, could I, could I somehow have the caller catch the exception and do less work than my throwing an exception? Actually, throwing an exception is, is, is the right answer. I'll come to later and say that's, that's the perfect answer in this case. But what do you think would happen if I didn't have this try catch? If I just said re return integer.parsint? And my caller had a catch block. So Java will throw an exception. And if nobody had a catch, it will go and print out the exception. But if my number of input lines does not have a catch, 
but my main has a catch, what do you think should happen? Returning the exception to the caller. The thing is that what you're saying here is that this is my return, legal return value. Please don't confuse my legal return value with my illegal things. Let's go not overload this one little you know, object I can return by having both error and non-error values. This is my legal stuff, and I'm going to essentially return to you the exception. Okay? That's really what it is. That we're going to be returning from methods both legal values and illegal values, and those are going to be exceptions that are returned. And those returned values are accessed by catch blocks, try catch blocks, okay? So, uh, okay, so I want to go and point out that we need to somehow return an exception in the previous case, okay? How are we going to do that exactly? We'll defer to a couple of slides later. Now, let's go and look at this function, method. This method is, and try to understand how it works. So it's got a try, and it's got a catch, and this catch is catching what kind of exception? So this try block is just assuming everything goes well, the user enters exactly the number of lines that is expected, and goes and echoes those many lines, okay? And my catch is going to catch what kind of exception that I talked about a little earlier? the input output exception and and what is that what is the bad thing that the user can do that will confuse the program the end of file premature end of file so it's going to get this exception and says oh you know i did not did not input the number of input lines um, and so it just exits the program okay so it's, it's that's how it's handling this handling this thing now suppose um and again, you know, do we, I mean, exiting, is that a good idea here? Can you imagine better error recovery? The main method could go in perhaps, yeah. It's just, it may not do something else. This is throwing up your arms too quickly. So again, we don't want to go and make this guy handle the exception. Okay? And now all your solutions don't seem to work very well. Right? I mean, this is not even a function. I can't return a minus one. Okay? I could go and make it a function and have only error codes returned, but then I confuse the programmer. The person who doesn't know what error says, is this a function or is this a, is this a procedure? Okay? So, so this whole thing about overloading the return value to be both legal return values and error values doesn't work very well with functions because there may be no space left. In, in the range of values. It's also confusing. And with method, with procedures, sure, all of these will be error values, but then you confuse it and, 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 and this no longer is, is, looks like a, even though it's a procedure, it looks like a function. Can you say the difference between a procedure and a function? The difference between a procedure and a function? Anybody want to answer that question? So procedure is, you know, cook this meal, okay? Function is add two and two, okay? So procedures don't return values. Procedures are void methods, okay? And functions are non-void. And so we know as setters are procedures, getters functions, and if setters started returning values, you'll confuse object editor, and you'll confuse a lot of other uh, programs, uh, readers of the program, because they're saying, you know, what does set really return? And it's, oh no, it's the error condition in case something really bad happens, okay? So the moral here is that we want to return things to the caller, we want to return values, and we need a way to do that. So, so decision to halt without full context, you know, maybe echoing fewer lines is okay for this caller, and only a warning can be given. Okay, something, something else can be, do, can be done. So caller should decide what. And so let echo lines and number of input lines not do the error handling. All they should do is error detection, Main should ha handle error reporting and associated UI. And what we do is, how do you pass the buck? We saw many, uh, many, many solutions. We could throw an exception. We could try to return some uh, illegal value, uh, which is what we're doing here. So we are entering, entering minus one. And we said all the problems that this can happen, you know, th th this can lead to. Uh, does not work if minus one was a legal value. And unsell you. 
So, and how do you pass the buffer procedure? Again, we saw the problem that procedure should not return any value, and we can convert it into a function that returns an error code, but that confuses people. I'm just repeating what I said earlier. Okay, we said it all in one slide. I'm saying it in many slides. Okay. By the way, uh, I spent the weekend and the last two days figuring out and, and converting this whole thing into a, into a video that I can just put on YouTube. And rather than you going through PowerPoints and in the recordings mode, and do you guys think that would be good, useful? Would it be? Why, why would it be useful? I, it takes a long time, and I've, I would try four times before I can do it. Sorry, if oh, oh, Max can't play? Oh, there is some, there is some, oh, I should have told you guys, there is some plugin you can use. Is there any other, I, so, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good, good, good. And, you, and also, you can do it, unless you use, uh, I think, Surface, most mobile computers will not play uh, PowerPoint recordings. They have Office versions, but they don't play it. So this way, you know, I don't know whether you want to ever look at it on a mobile computer or not, but you could, uh, if you just wanted the audio, you could just put on headphones and walk, walk and listen to it also, okay? So maybe before I prepare for the lecture, you know, rather than my sitting, sitting, sitting and reading something, I would just take a walk and prepare for the lecture. Okay, so that's my selfish interest in doing it. But anyway, I managed to do it for many of these slides. It takes many tries, and it, I would run it, or run it all night, and, and then it says sometimes I couldn't write the file, but I managed to do it for all the threads. Yeah. For any given algorithm slide, is there a way to skip to the second of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just not be in the PowerPoint mode. I, I mentioned this somewhere early. You can just be in the non-play mode and click on that icon and just move. Okay, uh, going back to this. So, uh, so passing the buck, error codes, and so I'm just, you know, uh, I'm just saying this many, many different ways. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I, what about, uh, what about uh, just having global variables? Just change some global variable that says this error occurred and let the caller go and look at the global variable. No, no passing. Global variable, I mean instance variable. So the method the, or, or maybe some static variable. It just makes you, yes, it just makes you cringe, yeah. Okay, so for every variable, I think I potentially waste a lot of memory. Sometimes is the memory not enough? What if I call factorial, which calls factorial, which calls factorial? How many variables can these factorial functions uh, access? Just one. But I might want to differentiate between the nth call to factorial and the n minus one call to factorial. Okay, so it's global variables are just often, you know, bad for these kind of things. Okay, and so. Um, uh, and then I have to go and make this variable accessible by all the methods, this global, right? Even though the caller and the callee are the ones that are supposed to look at it, all, all the other methods in that same scope can also look at it. So uh, I'm telling you, you know, maybe I shouldn't even talk about these bad things, uh, but uh, people have tried these, this, okay? So the least privileged principle is violated and so forth. So okay, finally, we get back to what we want to do. We want to propagate exception. We want to somehow return an exception value. And... We can do this in many ways, and one way to return an exception to my caller is to just not do anything. I don't have to go and throw a new exception here. I just don't catch it. Okay? If I don't catch it, like having so that basically says that you can be you can let you let exception be returned instead of regular values. So we saw exceptions are just objects that are typed, and these typed values can be accessed by the caller. So if you don't handle it, your caller has to handle it. Okay, so we don't have to go, we don't have to have any of these unpleasant um, alternatives that people had dealt with. You know, I've written programs in other languages that did all the things that I told you, tell you now not to do because those languages did not have exception. Okay. 
Okay? So these exceptions propagate through the call chain until some method responds to them by catching. Okay? So it's like I'm following and the first floor, am I going to have a net? If not, maybe in the second in the next floor down, I have a net. So the first net that catches me is the one that handles me. Okay? So you can have this is very important that you can have multiple nets that can catch the same exception, and the first one that catches it is the one that handles it. Okay? Questions? Yeah. So what are you saying that if you had that last thing where you didn't have um, a type int method, you could actually return an exception? Yes, you, by not doing anything, you are returning an exception. The exception that you should have caught is the one you return, and that you don't catch is the one you return. But you can define more. Okay. Yeah, so you can have 10 different kinds of exceptions, and any one of those can be returned back. <clears throat> you can only return one legal value, but you can return many different kinds of illegal values. And these illegal values are exceptions. Okay? Questions? So, caller, now here's an issue. You decided as a called method you were not going to catch this exception. Okay? But won't it be nice for the caller to know whether you caught it or not? Right? If you're going to not have your net on this floor, it'd be nice to tell the guy below you, you should have a net. Right? So, how should I tell? When I... I am the writer of echo lines. How should I tell my caller I'm not going to handle this exception? I'm not going to have a catch. Because there are two cases. I could handle it or I could not handle it. If I do, if I do handle it, I have to tell the echo lines, uh, my caller nothing. The, the echo lines caller can just be oblivious to the fact that there can be an error because it knows echo lines will handle it. But if echo lines is not handling it, I should go and tell my caller what's happening, right? Because after all, look at this void. By having void here, I told my caller, don't expect a value. By putting int here, I tell my caller, expect a value. Won't it be nice to even somehow go and tell the caller, expect an exception? And if you were to go and, and so how could you go and tell it? I mean, what's, what do we really want the method header to do now? It should go and list the exception, right? It should go and say, this exception, I'm going to, I expect my caller to, to handle. This exception, I expect my caller to handle. And, and the way to do that is by saying, throws exception, as somebody said, okay? So this is what we do. We tell the caller that passing it or throwing the exception, a special return value. So this is just like my void. I return nothing as a legal value, but I might give you this present. And this is my exception. Okay? So a little bit more syntax. Try, catch, and throws. Okay? Questions? I see people looking at this slide very intently. Okay, so all you're doing is acknowledging in your header the type of return value, essentially. Think of exceptions of return values, and you're just saying, this is my return value, one of my possible return values. So you have to install them so can return? Um, have to, should. <laughs> okay? So, let's say you can. Okay, we might, we might need a lot of next time's lecture to indicate the difference between can and should, and, and sh have to, okay? Let's just so, say right now that you should, or you can. Okay? So, I'm telling you, saying that. Any question before I'm, yeah? Okay. Echo lines is a method that has been called. Mm -hmm. It decided it was not going to have a try catch. Okay. It wants its caller, or its caller's caller, to handle it. So, it goes and tells its caller, I'm not handling I.O. exception. That's all I'm saying. 
The caller can decide to have a catch or say, I'm not handling it either. And say, I'm returning it to my caller. So this is a way for the caller to tell its, the, call, the, the callee, sorry, to tell the caller that I will return this value to you. That's the way to say it. And you should have the catch. Now I can have a catch for number format exception here and not a catch for IO exception. In which case I will go and say, I'm, I'm giving you the IO exception, but, I'm, but I'm, I don't say anything about number format exception. Okay? So all the exceptions you're not catching are the ones you return. Or you can return. Okay? So in this case, my echo line doesn't have any try catch, but it has a throws. Okay? So it, the programmer was pretty lazy, didn't have any try catch, but the programmer has to do some extra work by saying, I'm throwing this exception. I'm not really throwing the exception, I'm passing the buck. Okay? I didn't really do a new exception and throw it, which is something you can do. I just, whatever exception I got, I threw it back. Then you would say, throws exception one, comma exception two, comma exception three. And you can have catch exception one, yeah. Sorry. No, that's fine. I, even in the catch, I can have catch exception one. You can have a try block, block that goes and possibly throws five different kinds of exceptions and you can say catch exception E1, exception E2, exception E3. Okay, so, yeah, we could, we could go and catch something more abstract than e each of the specific exceptions. Let me just get uh, Peter's question first. So, even though this is a void method, it's still returning? An error. It's not really returning. It's just not catching, and you can think of it as returning. And that's what you're trying to do with the procedure codes, right? We were saying, yes, if the procedure works fine, we don't return anything to the caller, but if it does not work fine, we will return error codes. So, yes, it's a procedure, and in the error case, it's returning an error indication. It's not some value that is used. Is that Yeah, I, I'll show you later the code. Okay. So, is this like Is this kind of like a under the try catch thing? So, if, that's, if that creates an error, what would it ultimately print? We don't know. The, the caller of echo lines main will decide that, and we'll get to that. Okay? So if this, uh, yeah, good, I mean, <laughs> if this was an instance method and this was defined in a class, the interface can, can and should, in this case, also have the same thing, okay? Go a little further, further, I'm going to be answering, hopefully. And this is what's happening, okay? My main is now going, has a try, echo lines, and catches array index of the bounds exception here and catches IO exception here. Both, you know, both of my methods um, are, are now just passing the buck and the catch is being processed here. Okay, and you, you get to see how we have multiple catches also. You have a catch followed by another catch and this is the one that catches the array index of the bounds exception. This is the one that catches the IO exception. Okay. And the main method knows to catch the exception because the called method went and uh, acknowledged it, okay? So uh, we have about 30 seconds left. This code actually will not work, okay? So we'll see why it doesn't work. And look at this line here. And what are we doing here, by the way? Let's just quickly. What am I doing? I'm error recovering. When the person doesn't ask to enter, enter any argument, I do echo lines one, which means I will go and echo at least one line, okay? And this is going to cause us some problem. And we'll see that next time.
Okay, so what we'll do is uh, I'll cover as much of exceptions as I can, and then five minutes before uh, class ends, we'll briefly talk about the exam and what the exam is going to cover. Okay, any questions? So we were looking at exceptions last time, and we saw that we could execute statements like read line that have the potential of causing exceptions. Okay. Uh, in the case of read line, you could reach the end of file uh, and so not have a line to read and other kinds of errors could also occur, um, uh, especially if you're reading from the, from the disk, um, a file. And um, when you have an operation that can cause an error, you have two alternatives. You can try to surround it with a try-catch block and uh, handle the error or report the, handle the error there, which might involve just reporting or recovering. And that's a valid strategy. And that's relatively easy to explain. And another valid strategy is to say that, look, I don't have enough context in this, in me, I'm the caller, <coughs> to handle the error. Okay, so I'm going to pass the buck to my caller. Okay, so just as I, as a function, might return a value, a legal value to my caller, I can return or basically not catch an exception, which means it just implicitly returns to the caller. Okay? And if I do that, it'll be nice to tell my caller that I'm going to do that. So just as I go and tell my caller whether I'm going to return a value or not, and if I return a value, what type it is, I could go and tell my caller what kind of exception I might give to it, pass to it. Okay? So that's what this throws clause was about. It was like an extra return value. And where in languages without exceptions, you would have special error codes. And you'd have a single value being used both for error codes and for legal values. Now you have two different objects or multiple objects. You have one object that's being returned. Or in case of procedures, nothing is being returned. And you have various kinds of objects that can be returned for exceptions. Okay? So that's what we saw last time. And we saw that in echo lines, we decided uh, in this particular case that we really wanted main to handle that exception. So this is basically telling its caller, please handle the exception, and, and it's going to happen. And there was another method that main called number of input lines. This method also executed a, an operation that can cause an exception. And again, we decided that this particular function should not go and handle it, and it should not go and return some negative number because that will just confuse somebody who doesn't care about errors. And, and so this way, um, the legal value is returned here, and the illegal object is, is thrown back to the caller. Okay? So in both cases, we were deferring to the caller. And I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, because when you defer to the caller, then every caller must go and handle the exception. Okay? So if you can handle it within that function, please do. But often you don't have context. And when you're not handling it, somebody else needs to handle it. And, and, and in this case, it's the main method that's handling it. And we see that this main method is also has a try-catch. This try-catch has echo lines and number of input lines in it. And if you look at the code without looking, if you look at these two, uh, this code without knowing what happens in the call functions, you don't see any real error, error operation occurring. But in fact, the called functions all methods do have errors, and, and they are advertising that fact. And so main knows that it has to handle these exceptions. And our previous try blocks had only one catch. This try block has multiple catches, one for each kind of exception. Okay, so exceptions are typed, and we saw that you can have a legal return value of some type, plus you can have these illegal values returned to you of different types. And for each type, you have a separate catch block. Okay? So we are seeing here a, an, an example of how to have multiple catch blocks with tries. Okay? And what are these catch blocks doing? Uh, they are reporting the errors. Okay? And this catch block is trying to not only report the error, but recover from the error. It says, oh, the user did not enter any argument. 
let's assume that rather than having the user enter the program uh, and run the program one more time, let's give them a chance to enter at least one line. Okay, so this program, if you remember, it took from the, um, 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 uh, from the argument the number of lines it should echo, and then it went and read that many lines and echoed those many lines. And if the user did not enter an argument, then it assumes that the user wants at least one line echoed, so it goes and says, it, it calls echo lines with one. Otherwise, it just calls echo lines with the number of lines the user input. Okay, so it's doing some error recovery. And that's a nice ambitious thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do, but it's, it's a nice, nice goal to have. Okay? This is where we left last time. Okay, and I told you guys last time, look, this program won't, won't really work. It won't even compile, actually. And can anybody see the problem? Okay, go slowly. So you're saying there's some problem with this part? So you're happy with this catch, this catch block? Is this okay? Okay, so here's the deal. You can get only one exception at a time. Okay? You can't get two exceptions because you are executing some statement in the called method and that didn't succeed for one reason. And at that point, you, you, the try block is terminated. You don't go and try to execute the other statements within that try block. Okay, so that's why you can get only one exception. The moment an exception arises, the try block is terminated. That's why you put these quotes here, saying, this is my scope. And, and if I, the very first exception should go and exit it. Okay, so it's going to execute one or the other, and this is really an if-else. What's it saying? If my exception is instance of array index out of bounds exception, do this block, else do this block. Okay, so just as you have only one if-else part, execute, you know, either the if or the else part, the then or the else part, okay? Echo lines just take an uh, argument, right? It so happens a number of input lines went in and read it, read args of uh, read args that, that was passed to it. Okay, so args was the argument that the user provided. Nothing. Nothing. So it passed it to a number of input lines. Number of input lines tried to index it, and it threw up its hands and passed an exception back to this guy. It says, okay. You know, I understand that there was an array index or a bound exception. I really know what that means. So I will just call echo lines with one rather than just not do anything at all. So it would run forever, but it's expecting the user to input something. Okay, so there are two forms of input. One is in the main argument. One is the console input. Main argument didn't arise, uh, it didn't happen. It says, okay, I will go and give the user a chance to enter one line from the console. In the normal case, the user says four in the main, main, main arg, and it gives it a chance to echo four lines. When there's nothing, what should it do? You could say echo no lines, but we are trying to be a little clever and say one. Okay? Let's not debate too much whether that's right or not. I don't know it's right or not. Andrew? You're not catching my exception from the second, just the ones. Okay, so the problem that's occurring is we're trying to do too much. And whenever you try to do more, the more you do, the more errors you make, right? That's a that's fact of life. So I'm doing error recovery. When I call echo, when I tried this echo lines, I, I, I can get an IO exception. That's what I've got this handle. I've got that handled here. Now I'm calling echo lines with one. And this echo lines can also throw an IO exception. And there is no IO catch block for this guy. There's no try block here. This try block is handling this echo lines. This catch block is handling, you know, the same echo lines. Whereas there is no catch for this exception. Echo lines can throw an exception and, and, 
and, and what happens to that exception. So basically, we are trying to do error handling. The error handling code can accept throw an exception, and we're not catching that exception. Yeah, so Java says that you better go and cast this exception. At least in this case, it's saying that. Sometimes it says it's okay. We'll try to figure out how it decides that. But here Java says you really should catch this exception. So if Java really insists on this rule, how should I change this code? Austin? So I nest the try catch inside this just as I can have nested ifs. Same thing, right? Because I would get an exception and, and, and I would go and say if it's this kind of exception, that kind of exception. KJ? So my while loop, I don't have, you know, it's while loop means I'm going to do a bunch of things. So what you're saying is that I call echo lines once, I call echo lines a second time. So somehow there's a while loop. It should be done with a with while loop. While I can't echo, keep doing it. Right? That's a little bit more. Is there a reason why we couldn't put the try catch block in the echo lines method itself? And that's what I was saying. There's two ways to go about doing it. If we put it in echo lines, it doesn't know, it doesn't know the context. So should it choose one or should it choose zero? It doesn't know. And we know that this main method knows that, that the number that it passed to echo lines comes from argument, from, from, is, is the number of lines to be echoed and it came from the arguments and the argument was missing. So it has more context to put one, whereas echo lines, doesn't have enough context. And that's, like I said, you can go both ways. And if I go that way, life is easy. I want to make life complex. And I want to talk about a situation where the method cannot solve the problem. Wait, so are you asking like, what do we do with the echo line like from one? Yes, and I, we already got the answer. Okay. So this has, so the, the reason I'm not doing it in echo lines there is because I want context. Okay. And IO exception is not caught. And I can do some while programming that will really doesn't make sense here, actually, uh, because we don't want to do it repeatedly. We're just doing it twice. Okay. And I do something like this. Okay. I say try echo lines one and I catch this exception and, and I'm giving a message here. Did not input the one input string, which is the default in the case of missing argument before input was closed. So I'm being very clear. This is what I tried to do. You did not even, so the user did two mistakes. Okay, the first the user did not enter an arg main argument, and then when you were provided with, you know, one, one line to echo, it just said, the user just said, end a file and terminate it. Okay, so it's saying, okay, you know, this is why I try to do it, and this is the reason why I'm failing. So, you know, this is really what you want. You don't want some awkward while loop here, because you're not really doing it a third time. Okay, you're just doing it twice. There's no, nothing to count. Okay, everybody happy with this? So you can have nested try catches. That's the point I'm going to make. Okay. Okay. Notice here that I used E here and E here and I O E here. Okay. E is like my I. I mean, it's kind of got a well-defined name. I, you know, I, I like to use long names. But for, ind for indices, you know, it's universally accepted that i is a good, good variable. And similarly, it's universally accepted that e is a good variable for exceptions. Okay? And, but I couldn't, use e or, 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 I couldn't use e here. So why could I use e? Yeah, Fred? Could you create um, basically like a try echo lines method that contains try and catch blocks and use recursion? You don't have a, you don't have a nest for the catches? So you, you want me to also handle in echo lines the exception? Is that what you, what you want, want, me, want me to do? Well, my question right now is, okay, first, are you trying to answer my question? Or do you have a separate question? Separate question. Let's try to answer my question first. Okay. So yeah. like the catch statement is just another block of code, and in that block of code, it knows that the A e is an array index outbound to exception, so you cannot use Whereas 
associated with anything. That's why you can use it in this lab. Okay, so this catch and this catch have both got curly braces in them, right? Curly braces in general define scopes. Okay? Scopes are areas of code that have variables that you can declare in them. Okay? So this scope and this scope are, are independent. It's like two methods in a, in a, in a two instance methods in a, in, a, in a class that can both have the variable E because they're independent scopes. Okay? You're going to be either in this or this. But when you are here, this scope is nested within this scope. Okay? And just as a method is nested within a class, so the method class, the instance variables are, are visible in the method, this scope's variables are visible here. So Java says, Java could have used two rules. It could have said, if you declare an E here, then, you, then this particular E is hidden. It could have done that. Okay? Just as when you declare a variable I in a method, an I instance variable gets hidden. Or it says, no, I, I, don't, I won't let you hide that variable, and so I'm going to go and insist that the nested scope have different names, for, for, uh, not use the variables in the scope it's nested in. Okay, that's the reason for I. Okay, okay, back to your question, Fred. So what's your question? Yes, a method can throw, yes, in fact, we'll see on the next slide that this is, if this main method did not catch these two exceptions, it could have thrown exceptions to its caller, and it could have thrown both exceptions. Okay. okay. So, my question is, say if we, if we went back a step, and we had closed the old code, and we didn't have a try and catch plugging the echo lines called more string, can we create a method called try echo lines, which was identical to that? Okay, so you're pretty much saying what KJ said. He said, let's have a while loop, you won't have recursion. And while loops and recursion are duals of each other. Right? I just want to do two steps. Either I want to do one or nothing. So why, why do I need recursion? I can have a try-catch block. And, and yes, maybe, I'm, may, and in this case, I just want to. But yes, you can try to do more than one. You know, if the, does it, the person doesn't even enter one, they can enter, try another value. So you can keep going. But each time you're doing something different, and that recursive method is going to become very awkward, just as this while loop is going to become very awkward. Okay? And, and I didn't want to debate too much the right answer. I just want to show you nested exceptions and nested scopes. Yeah. And I can do it with this example. Okay? So that's the real reason I'm doing it this way. So, so, so not recursion, but just have a separate method. Just, just not have this long method here. Look, look how complicated this code has become. Okay, I want to point out this thing. That my normal code is one line. My error handling code, and you know, when, when, when Word crashes on you, when Google Docs crashes on you, guys, error handling is hard. And this slide is showing you that. Okay, and that's why it's good to separate the erroneous code from the non-erroneous code. And my erroneous code has become very clumsy, okay? And how do, I, how do I go and modularize it? Exactly as you guys are saying, okay? That I certainly have to have the catches in the scope. I can't avoid that. I could put this in a separate method. You know, it's going to just do this one line. But it will be nice to go and put this whole code in another method so that my, this particular main method becomes less, less cluttered. Absolutely. Okay? Not recursive, but I'm just going and taking something that's a monolithic method and making that into... Multiple methods. Okay. Um, so, in the nested try catch, the system would print out did not input the one input string and so on. Did the user fail to input that one line in the console that was implied by the echo line? Absolutely. That's my message. So, I couldn't go in. This message and this message are different. Okay. Uh, sorry, this message and this in, uh, message are different. That's why I, I didn't modularize it. Okay. But, absolutely. Uh, to avoid this nesting problem, we could have just had a separate method and then called it E. But in that method, then this particular E wouldn't be accessible and, and you'd have to pass it as a parameter if it's really accessible. So, yeah, that's not the point I'm trying to make, but indeed, 
you should not have such big methods, okay? Other things? Okay, so let's go to what, uh, so pa parameters and siblings tries can have same. And here, my main, we show that we can have more than one exception being thrown. And my IO exception and array index of bond, uh, uh, out of bounds exception are both being thrown by main because main doesn't handle either of those two exceptions. It says, I'll pass it to my caller. Okay, so everybody's now got, got into this pass the buck. Okay. Who is main's caller? Who calls main? The operating, system. operating system, Andrew? The, JVM. The, the interpreter. Okay. So the JVM calls it. Operating system calls JVM. You say Java and Java calls me. Okay. And what does, and we've seen when we don't do any handling, it is main that goes and prints a print, print, uh, stack trace and it tells you what the exception is, okay? So this is equivalent to doing nothing and saying, I just want the default handling, which isn't that bad, we saw, compared to some other languages, okay? So um, this is probably not a good idea, okay? Uh, but I want to show you that multiple exceptions can be thrown, and if, and, and if you throw it, if you don't catch an exception, the interpreter or the JVM finally goes in, catches it, and has to handle it, and it has a default way of handling. Questions? So this is really not a good idea, okay? I'm just demonstrating these concepts because you can probably do better than the interpreter does. And the interpreter is just going to say, as we saw last time, array index out of bounds exception. It's not going to say, hey, user, you forgot to enter an argument. Okay, so we really should go give those long messages that we saw in the previous slide. Okay, but you can't. Okay, so we were, we, were, we, were, we, were, we were bad that we went and uh, through, through the exceptions to the interpreter, but at least we acknowledged them. So let's look at some of the alternatives we have for array index or for a number of input lines. I can go and cache the exception, and that is not a bad idea. Again, you know, I went to this more complicated case. In general, it's not a bad idea. In this particular case, I argued that, that you know, the zero was not a good value to return back. Um, or I can throw the, I can not handle the exception and throw and acknowledge the fact that I don't handle the exception and by this throws clause. This goes to your question now. What if I go and not handle the exception and not have a throws clause? What would that mean and would that even be legal? Zach? Right? You've all done that before. <laughs> You've all handled array indexes <laughs> in the season and not done it. Excellent. Isn't it, like, wouldn't it just still throw the exception up until you can catch it later? It's just yeah. not informing future users of it? Okay. So it's not as if this particular throws clause has any effect on the execution of the program. It's not as if some value will be returned that won't be returned otherwise. This throws clause is purely a form of documentation okay so the exception will be propagated regardless of whether you go and say throws or not and like Zach said we've all done it before okay now so given that Java can let us do this or this which should we do really now that we know better you've all done it before because you didn't know better now that you have this extra tool in your hand, should you use it everywhere? Should, so should I have actually said this here? Should you document? Can't argue against that, right? Especially when, when we guys are not catching you on comments. Okay, at least do this kind of documentation. Okay, and this is a good kind of documentation. Documentation that the Java understands, can interpret, something we can check through our grading program without interpreting and scanning comments. So this is a good idea to go and tell the caller, look, you handle it, I'm not handling it. So throws is a form of documentation, just like comments, but comments are unstructured 
It's more like annotations, your interfaces and assertions, which are something that the programming language can understand. Okay, so uh, that's a good question. So this particular function, we, we saw that we got away here without saying throws. For the same reason, if we say throws here and main doesn't do a try catch around it, it'll be fine. You shouldn't, but it'll be fine. Okay? But we'll, we'll, get, we'll answer that question really properly in a few minutes. But the, but the answer right now is that just as you can get away without the throws here, you can get away with the try-catch in the main also. Okay? In this case. Okay? So, uh, guys, at least understand what's happening here, that we really should have said throws. But if we don't, Java won't complain. But our greater program can catch these things and say, hey, you did not throw this exception, and here's five points taken out. Yeah. Alt exceptions are all typed. Okay, so so if somebody throws an exception, array index out of bounds exception, it'll remain an array index out of bounds exception till it reaches the interpreter. It's not going to get collapsed into some general class, the interpreter, because it, the interpreter is going to go and actually tell you what kind of exception it was. So it needs to know the exact exception. So I think you said that does it take does it go and convert all exceptions into some general class of exception? Okay, so the main method, the, the interpreter, when it gets an exception, has to go and tell you some, give you some message, right? It's not going to try to recover. It's not going to run any code. It's just going to report the error. It needs to know exactly what the error is. Yes, but there is some general exception class that has some general method that the interpreter can call to figure out what message to print, and we'll see that also in a few minutes. <coughs> Okay, now I'm going to confuse you guys. Okay, so, so if we don't document, again, I'm trying to convince you guys that this, this at least in this case, just in this case, throwing, saying throws array index out of bounds exception is a good idea because this way the caller knows that it must handle it. Okay, so this is good documentation for the caller. And otherwise it may not have code to handle. But Java is not going to complain, so our, our grading program will have to do this thing. Okay. And, and, and uh, now my main method can go and say throws array index out of bounds exception. Um, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say here is if I go and look at echo lines, and in echo lines, if I don't catch the exception, and I say, I do not acknowledge the exception, Java will do what my grading program was going to do. It will complain and say, sorry, you must say throws. So in the previous case, it said, that's OK. Let the grading program check this. But in this example, if echo lines neither catches nor acknowledges which is what's happening here, that this is not acknowledging and the main method doesn't catch this exception either and it doesn't acknowledge either and Java will go and not complain in both cases. Okay? So Java is not uniform about what it does. Okay? That for some exceptions, it checks that you, you, you are actually acknowledging an uncaught exception. 
And for some exceptions, it does not do the checking. Okay? So somehow it makes this rule and between these two programs, and it made the, and it, it really can't under, analyze your programs, you know, because of the halting problem. So it's going to use some very crude method of doing so. And the crude method is that some exceptions are checked exceptions. Some are not checked exceptions. IO exception must be a checked exception because we see it's being complained about here. And array index out of bounds must be an unchecked exception. Okay, so we have to complicate now our whole explanation of exceptions by saying that there's two kinds of exceptions. Not all exceptions are equal. Okay? And that's what I'm going to say here, that we have to now think about unchecked exceptions and checked exceptions. Okay? And checked exceptions, you have to worry about interfaces also. Okay? So if my echo lines here, in, in, my, so, so in my previous example, echo lines was a static method. Okay? So I, don't have to, I didn't have to worry about interfaces. Let's suppose that echo lines becomes now an interface method, uh, an, 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 an instance method, which means it can be put into an interface. For checked exceptions, if my instance method does not catch the exception, then we see that it must, in its header, say, throws IO exception. Do you think the interface header should also have this rule? Should? It's documentation, right? And, and ultimately, the user, the user of that class is going to look at the interface. They're not going to look at the class. Okay? So, if it's not caught in body, it must be act in, in method header of the class. And if it's act in method header of the class, it must be act in, sorry, this must have been, should have been interface. It should have been act in the interface header of the method also. Okay, so that's our check rules. Zach? If it's acting the interface, um, what's the method header, does Java require it to be in the class method header that implements the interface too? So if, if the other way around, if it's act here and not act here, will Java complain or not? Okay, we might not get to that answer today or ever, if, depending on what we do in the last day. It's, it's complicated. Uh, let's just say that this particular method, whether it's act here or not, depends on the body of the method. Okay? So the answer is no. Okay? If it's act here and it's not act here, it's okay with Java as long as the body is consistent with the header. Why that's the case, I'll just have, you'll have to wait for that. Okay? Andrew? Okay, so you, you guys really want the answer from me right now. Uh, this is really Zach's question. And you're, you're trying to ask, you know, why is that the case? And let me, let me just sort of give you an, an analogy here. So if I come into this class and I say, I really don't know exceptions, I really don't know loops, but I'll try to explain them to you, right? And I try to explain. So I, I, I go and act something that is, I'm, I'm underestimating, I'm underselling myself. Okay? If I undersell myself and I do a good job teaching exceptions, you'll be all delighted, right? <laughs> if I come in and say, I know everything about exceptions, and I can't answer this question for you, you'll say, you know, I don't trust this guy. Right? If I give you aspirin and say, no side effects, and you get bleeding, you're going to be really mad. Okay? Rather than vice versa. So what went wrong? If in the interface I go and say, you know, I really don't handle anything. You handle IO exception. You handle this exception. What's going to happen? Your main method your, is going to be ready for these exceptions. It's going to be ready to get dizzy. It's going to be ready to look up Google for exceptions rather than rely on, rely on this. Right? So it's okay to undersell yourself in life, I think, and in Java. Okay? So the real reason why you can get away with, with, with and I really wanted to explain this stuff to you guys, but, you know, I didn't know whether I'll have time to do it or not. So I'm kind of glad you forced me to say this. I've got slides later to say this in a better way. So um, 
you can, in, and, and, and Andrew was kind of giving the reason, that this interface method could be implemented by five different classes. Four of them could be well behaved. One could be one that doesn't, um, doesn't catch the exception. So, so it's okay for the, well, for the interface method to be more conservative and for each class method to go and say, look, I don't throw an exception. I can guarantee you that. So I'm not going to acknowledge it. Okay. As long as the interface acknowledges it, the interface will acknowledge it as long as there's even one implementation that may have it. So that's the reason why, you know, even if one person gets dizzy with the medicine, you go and say it can cause dizziness. Okay. So that's kind of the analogy. And I'm doing this without slides. I have nicer slides to say this nicely later, but that's the intuition. Okay. Questions? Okay. Now we have to figure out, we understand the rules, kind of. Okay. There's checked exceptions. There's unchecked exceptions. But why? Why have rules? You know, I mean, the more rules you have, the more time to spend in class explaining them, the more you have to study, the more questions I can ask you in the exam. Uh, so, you know, why not just have one uniform set of exceptions? Why have, you know, why have this situation where array index order bounds exceptions need not be acknowledged, but IO exception must be acknowledged, and you get an error in this case, and you don't get an error in this case. Why? KJ? If you, if you had to say throws IO ex, uh, array index out of bounds, or, uh, array index out of bounds exception each time, there'll be a revolt here, right? I mean, you, know, you, don't, you don't get to write code. You get to write mostly throws. Whereas IO exceptions you think are out of your control. Whereas array index out of bounds exceptions you think are in your control. Okay? That's Java's principle. Okay? And it has to do with the kind of errors. So the errors that are under your control are, we will, are basically... So, so, and here's where you'll have a revolt, okay? Here I am, I'm saying args is hello and goodbye. And then I go and say print line args one. <coughs> is an array index out of bounds exception going to occur in this case ever? It's in your control. I was able to control it. I programmed well. And why should Java go and force me to go and say this? Now, here's what Java could do. Java could go and say, I will analyze your code and see whether args1 could, could ever be um, uh, a subscript error or not. I will just understand your code and, and, and force you to go and say this only if you have made, a, made an error. Could Java do that? Because of the halting problem. If it can't even tell you whether your program will halt, how can it tell you whether it will go and have this particular state at this particular point? So because of the halting problem, it can't in general tell whether some code will actually cause exception or not. Now, in this case, it can. The tools are good enough to know that since there's no loops here, it can easily go and tell that this will not be executed. Okay? But in general, it doesn't want to bother, and it's going to take a very conservative approach. Okay? And when it takes a conservative approach, it wants to prevent as much as possible the cry-wolf syndrome, where you're just giving false positives needlessly. Okay? And this will be a cry-wolf situation. Because it just says, you know, the only rule it can use, that, 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 that the naive rule it is, rule is that if a, a subscript error can be, can be thrown, that means if a subscripting happens, I will go and acknowledge, ask you to acknowledge. And subscripting can happen without it being unsafe. Okay, array subscripting can happen. So it's guaranteed to not happen. And array indexing does not imply exception. There's a lot of text I'm going to go through right now because it's important. Um, so it implies it may happen. Halting problem prevents Java from knowing if an exception will actually be thrown. In this case, it can check that, but it doesn't. And its exception checking assumes the worst case. Okay. And in the case of exception, check exceptions, maybe the cry wolf won't be too bad. Okay. That's the hope that these kind of exceptions, you know, the false positives will not be too many or at all. Okay. And and if you make all exceptions checked, then we would have, you know, we would have with this, this, we would have much more cry wolf than otherwise. Okay. So the question is, what principle do we decide to use to decide which are checked exceptions, which are not checked exceptions? Okay. And and KJ pretty gave us the reason that there are exceptions that are in under our control, and there are ones that are not. 
Internal errors are errors in our program. External errors are errors because of the user, because of some other program, because of the disk, who knows what. So exceptions that have to do with, with uh, user and external errors are checked. Exceptions that may have to do with them are checked. And the exceptions that probably have to do with internal errors are unchecked. Okay? That's its, that's its principle. Okay. So we know that there exist two kinds of exceptions. We know the principle behind that. Whether the principle is actually followed or not is the next question. Okay. Questions? Okay. So, so the question is, you know, which kind of errors are principle? And again, this is just, I, I, this is just stating in text what I said earlier, uh, that, uh, that you know, if 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 it's an internal error that you have prevented, then acting is bad for two reasons. A, you have to go and type all that junk, and second, it's misleading. It's not even true. Okay, so you really don't want the the false positives. Okay, so that's what this text is saying. So, Java rules are justified if checked exceptions are external errors. And unchecked exceptions are internal errors. If that is the case, then, then Java's rules are ex, you know, the perfect rules to have. Okay? Now the question is, is it true that based on the two examples you've seen, that checked exceptions are always external errors and unchecked exceptions are always internal errors? Based on the examples we've seen, no, right? Because and say throws array index of the bounds exception. I could just be good here. But then KJ will ask me, what about its caller? What if the caller doesn't go and put it, and the caller doesn't handle the exception, what about its caller? And the caller maybe doesn't know very much about this, ex about this particular exception. So how could I, f this guy who wrote number of input lines is very disciplined. We trust this person. This person wants to document, and they want it to propagate up also. So by saying throws error index, uh, index out of bounds exception, I've, I've solved the problem at one level, but not at another level or when, when it comes to my being called. Could you create a new exception class? That's exactly what I'm leading to. Okay? And that exception class could be a checked exception. Okay? And then what would you do? You would go in, what would this particular method do then with that exception class? So it would catch the array index out of bounds exception and throw the new exception. And that would be a check exception and that would force the caller also to go and either catch it or acknowledge it in the head. That's exactly what I'm leading to. And before I go down to that step, I'm going to take a lazy approach. So what I'm saying here is that there is no reason, to, uh, no way to force every caller that does not handle to, it to act it. And what I could do is take a lazier approach and say, I will convert my array index out of bounds exception into an I.O. exception. 
After all, an I.O. exception is an input-output exception. It's a very general class. And I will go and say, throw new I.O. exception and say first argument missing. Now we know I.O. argument argue, exception is checked, so now my caller will have to go and act it. So you, you want KJ's scheme or you want this scheme? New exception or just use an existing exception? And I mean, new exception does we split the current code when it gets the IO exception and already code there for handling it, so it wouldn't fully go into that jargon. Yeah, so so maybe I'm I'm making it too general. And I'm missing the fact that this is a missing argument exception to be handled differently. And what am I doing? I am being a little good. I'm giving this error message here. The code there could go and look at there is a way to get the message that you are putting in here from the exception object that's passed to you. It could do, go and get that message object, decode it, and figure out that this is this kind of exception. But why should you go and pass that code? Okay? So why not just have a new type of exception that indicates it's this kind of exception and have a separate catch block for it? Okay? So we're going to do... So we can throw exceptions. That's, that's nice, by the way, that we can throw our own exceptions. It's not that we only propagate exceptions thrown to us we can actually throw our own exceptions, okay? And here's the message. And, and uh, now we do force every caller that does not handle it to act it, but we've lost the fact that this is this kind of I.O. exception. So exception message distinguishes it from read exception, but we don't want to decode it. And the query will go and throw a missing argument exception. That's our type. And we can also give a little message to be printed out for the user. Okay, so that's my, so that we can have our own exception classes. This is power. Okay, not only can we throw exceptions ourselves, we can have our own classes. So, and you've seen that in recitation also. Well, I'm just curious, how many of you did assignment 11 with exceptions? Okay, excellent. Okay, okay. one person kind of did it, but that was, you know, you had to go and understand all of this stuff and it's not easy. And except error handling is not easy anyway. And to use exceptions for it is, is very good. Okay, excellent. I was wondering whether I should even put that in or not. I said probably nobody would try it, but I'm glad I, I, I put the challenge in. And how many of you did undo? Okay, three people. So maybe I will explain a little bit of undo on the last day of class so that you understand what you were doing. Okay. Um, now the question becomes, how do I, uh, how do I declare missing argument exception? And... Uh, <coughs> What do you think goes, oh, you guys have seen this in recitation. So let's just go and, uh, so type of exception rather than message explains the exception. And here's our missing argument exception. Okay. It extends IO exception. We know it's, it is the form of IO exception. And what does it do? It, it just passes the message to its superclass, which knows how to store the message. Every exception has a message stored in it. We see from this. And it just takes its constructor argument, passes it to the superclass. So it's doing nothing beyond passing the argument to its superclass. And we know it's a checked exception because IO exception is a checked exception. It's a subclass of IO exception, so it must also be a checked exception. Okay. Any questions here? Query? To go in, so if... If I'm not giving you information, you're to query me, right? You just queried me for this question. You pulled it out from me. So you have to go to the exception object and get the message out from it. So if you study databases ever, you sort of get from the database information. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you just forget sometimes how much of a nerd you are when you spend so many years in computer science. That which, are, which are English words and which are computer science words. And I keep asking you guys, is this word in English also? Okay, because I've forgotten. I'm brainwashed. And uh, it's, it's interesting now that computing is so pervasive that you can use words like caches and, and the general population will know what you're talking about because when they go and buy their computers, they are told, you know, this has got more cache than this computer. And at one time, you know, you, you just were weird. Okay. Uh,
classes, and it says throws an error, does it say throw a missing argument exception? Or if you type it in the IO exception, that doesn't really work that way. But since they throw the missing argument exception, you would always throw an object. That object should be of type exception. And what, I, what we did in the previous slide was say throw new missing argument exception. We could have constructed the object first and then thrown it. You can construct the object and not even throw it. Actually, I do that in programs of it. Okay? Because exceptions have these, this, this stack and built into them and I want to know the stack sometimes. So you can, you can, and we just did it all in one statement. Okay? Questions? Okay, so we know this missing argument exception must be, must be a checked exception because it's a subclass IO exception. Supposing I wanted to create an exception that is not checked. I just want to type the array index of the bounds exception as saying you did not index the first element correct. And I wanted a separate exception for the second one and the third one. Okay. Uh, how could I make an unchecked exception, you think, in Java? Zach? So you would have to ex extend some existing unchecked exception. So it would be nice to have some general class, which is an unchecked exception and subclass from there. Right? And does anybody know in Java, uh, what is that class? Andrew? It's a great name. So, uh, okay, by the way, there is no interface here. And I'm not being bad. I just, I'm not adding any methods. And Java does not have interfaces for exceptions. So I can't have, you know, I don't want to go and take their methods and put them in an interface. So we just don't have any interfaces here. Okay. Uh, Java, sh you know, I, I, I keep saying that Java should have had interfaces in many places. And, and this is one example. Okay. Uh, so I'm just justifying why a missing argument error is a subclass of IO exception here. And is this checked? And we know IO exception is checked, so it's checked, and I have some general rules. An exception class must be a subclass of an existing exception class. Okay, that's how that's what makes it an exception. That what's what that's what makes it have some message that can be printed out by the interpreter, have a stack trace that can be printed out by the interpreter. And any class that is a subclass directly or indirectly of runtime exception is an unchecked exception. Okay? And any other, if you, if, if you don't have in your, uh, as a superclass runtime exception, you're checked. Okay. And I said it's a great name, runtime exception. And I was being a little sarcastic there. Oh, uh, yeah, Zach? Is there a general class like runtime exception for checked exceptions? No. So it, it, the, we just need a Boolean value, right? It's either ch uh, checked or not checked. So there's one class, runtime exception, that is, oh, class exception. So there's a class exception that is the, that is the superclass of all exceptions. So you just extend, uh, a runtime exception ex extends that directly or indirectly. And if you, if, if in your path you encounter class exception without hitting runtime exception, then you're checked. Otherwise you're unchecked. Okay. And why is runtime exception a bad name? All exceptions are runtime. <coughs> so what are you saying by calling some exception? Uh, it's a tautology, right? Every exception is runtime. They should have called it unchecked. And when I started teaching this stuff, I called it, I, I invented the word checked in my head. And now I Google it and everybody else seems to have invented the same word. So it, this was the right term to have had. And, and they just called it runtime and they're stuck with legacy code now. Okay. So a lot of people will call unchecked exceptions runtime exceptions because they're instances of that class, but they're really every exception is runtime. Questions? So this is my hierarchy, which, which is what Zach was asking for. Exception is the top level there. And it's got many subclasses, IO exception, runtime exception, and so forth. And now, based on this, is class cast exception a checked or unchecked exception? <coughs> unchecked. And remote exception is a? And what do you guys think remote exception is? I'm going to look. Another program, distributed program, a remote program. Okay. So, uh, 
So these are my unchecked exceptions and these are my checked exceptions. Okay? The, the rule I gave you guys earlier. Okay? Questions? Um, so, in this example, I got this exception object and I didn't do anything with it. Okay, we type all these exceptions, we have, and, and I, I just, just ignore, besides the label, if, you know, I just do instance of on the object. I really don't use any data here in all of these examples. Okay, and just let's try to go and imagine what are some of the methods an exception object might have that one could use. And I've already hinted what these methods might be. Get error string, exactly. It's called get message. And what, what other method I've hinted at? And I can go here and say echo lines and say print line E. When I say print line E, what do you think the two string of E would be? Print line will call the two string method. The two string method would be the message. Okay. And here I'm going and, uh, okay. So what I'm doing here is basically implicitly, I, I'm using the e, uh, um, uh, exception and I'm calling two string and I'm printing the exception, which will print the message that we pass on the constructor. We saw that the constructor took a message as an argument. That same message will be printed out when we print out an exception. Okay. So in both of these cases, I'm now printing line. I'm, I'm being much lazier, okay? Uh, I'm doing it for a reason. I'm just printing out the, mess, uh, the exception. I'm not giving any elaborate message. Yeah, Zach? Um, when it's thrown by like, the compiler, I guess, like, is there a default message in the exception? So when it's... When, like when you yes, yes. When you don't throw the exception, when, when, when the runtime throws the exception, not the compiler, it will go and populate the message field with some something. And that's the message field you guys have been getting when you got the exception. Uh, Fred, you had? Okay, given that, given that I want to just print the exception, given that, let's not debate whether that's, that's a good idea or not. Can I make this code better? What's wrong with this code? And I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing. So could I replace it with one catch block? Yeah. And what would that catch be? Okay, so uh, this, is, this, is, this is the, you know, if, if, when you go and print out E, you get the E.get message. This is what I was saying earlier. And you get the type and the, so the two string is the message plus the type. I, I was wrong. It's not just the uh, message you sent in. It is the uh, name of the class plus the message. That is what the... Uh, so, uh, okay. And, and, and I guess I, I asked that question a little prematurely. Now, it's, uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm saying, saying e dot print stack trace in both cases. Okay. And we're going to get a stack trace. And what stack trace will this be, by the way? Sorry? Okay, so the main method was called, right? The main method called number of input lines. Number of input lines returned, an exception was thrown at that point, right? And it was caught back in main, right? So I had a stack before number of input lines was called. When the exception, then, then I have a stack when the exception was thrown, and then when I have, a, I have a stack when the exception is caught. Which one of these three stacks will it be, will be, will be printed out? Zach? When, when it's thrown. The catch knows at this point what the stack is. So why does it need to go and print it out? I mean, it, it, you know, that information is there. What you want to know is you might be catching it five levels later, 
and you want to know where it was thrown and what was the stack at that point. And that is what you guys get when the interpreter prints out your stack trace. There is no stack. All the methods are returned to it. But you will get the stack at the point at which the exception is thrown and you will go and see stacks that are this big when object editor throws an exception for you. You don't even know what's happening there. But I tell you guys, go send me the message because it gives me information about the exact line number and, and, and uh, the method call. Okay? So it is that stack trace. So stack when exception is thrown, not when it is printed. Okay? And you'll get something like this. And this is what the interpreter will also do. And this is what you can do by having a print, print stack trace. Okay? Questions? Okay, and now I'm going to answer the question that I asked earlier prematurely. How do we remove the question? And we can just say catch IO exception. And remember, okay, let's say we don't care about, uh, so let's say we want to do something different, okay, exactly what Keenan was saying. I want, in the case of IO exception, to print stack trace. In the case of missing argument exception, just print it out. Let's say I want to do it, okay? Uh, would this work? Because everything would get captured right here. It's doing. Is it instance of this, else instance of this? And could Java go and tell you you're doing something wrong here? Yeah, there's no complex code to be analyzed here. It just has to go and look at the order of the exceptions and see whether, whether, whether a subclass exception occurs before a super type. Okay? So it'll actually tell you unreachable code. Oh, I better remember to stop at 1210. Uh, okay, so this is what you want to do. You wanted the subclass exception to be before the superclass exception. Okay. Okay, let's look at this code. One of the exceptions here is array index out of bounds exception. Is there another kind of exception that you can uh, that can be thrown here? number format exception, okay? And we can Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm just being lazy, and I just say exception. That's a generic, okay? So you're being, uh, uh, you know, you're being good, you're doing catching, but you're being as bad as you can be when you're being good, right? You're being very general and say catch exception, and I do this all the time, okay? So 
you know, I don't know sometimes what to do, so I just I'm just going to print the stack trace and 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 so uh, this is something you could do, but if you can do something better and more specific, it's good. Okay. Okay. Um, let me go to something apparently very different but related. When I'm initializing a variable, I could initialize the, uh, initializing an instance variable. I could initialize it when declaring the variable, or I could initialize it. I thought in a constructor. I thought I heard it. Okay. Uh, okay. So I could have an undeclared variable and declare it in the constructor. What do you guys think? I've never. I never gave you a rule for this because I don't have a clue. Uh, what do you guys think is, is better? Constructor because? Sorry? No, you don't say memory. I mean, the variable is there. It's got one slot. What if you had four constructors and it had to be initialized the same way? Then the answer might be while declaring it, unless all constructors call a common method. Yet somehow your instinct was constructor, right? Did you think any reason? It's just what I've been doing. This is what you've been doing? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say that exception handling makes your answer the correct one. Can you see how constructor would be the right place to initialize something when, when you consider ex the fact that exceptions can be thrown? Okay, so you're saying you'll get fewer exceptions if, 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 if you initialized it while declaring it because you know 100%. That's, that's a very subtle and it's a great answer. There's, uh, there's a more direct answer. So here I'm initializing it to a constant 5. Could I initialize it to something more complex? I could say 5 plus 6. Even more complex, what could it be? Sorry? Plus another variable, something even more complex. Could I call a could I call a function? Could that function throw an exception? In which case would the exception be caught? Could be caught. So let's go and say that I'm saying input. Um, so I'm going and initializing this number by some function call here. And this function call could go and uh, access an array index index and, and, and use that array index to uh, or, or uh, have a missing argument exception. Some, this function call could go and throw an exception. If I did this, there's no catch block. Java can't go and insist that uh, you have a catch block around it because there's no code around it. But if I go and do it in a constructor, then it can go and force you to catch the exception, okay? So sometimes you are forced to do it in a constructor and maybe if that, if that function becomes, if that expression will later become a function that might throw an exception, maybe the approach of, of uh, initializing in a constructor is a better approach because it's more extendable, okay? Uh, so Java will, Java will, Uh, not sh okay, now let's do some more fun stuff. Supposing I want to time my methods. So I want to know how long the method to do it is this. You guys, you know, if you want to ever do this, this is there's a convenient facility. You can ask Java what the current time is. So you can ask Java what the current time is at the, when the method starts. And then there's a lot of paths through the method. Before you return, okay, so I'm, I'm returning here, I'm returning here, uh, I'm returning here by throwing an exception, and I'm returning here by just returning zero, 
there are three paths here. I can just go and print out the current time in milliseconds minus the save time. You guys see how I'm doing it? Yeah, I save the time at the start. There are three exit points. Before each of the three exits, I go and check the current time and I subtract from the current time what the value was. Can I make this cleaner? Can I think of a Java construct? Can you guys invent something in Java that will make this cleaner? How could, what's, what's the dirty part here? What's the dupli code duplication here? This statement is done three times. Yeah. How? Okay, so you're saying I move this outside, I don't return here, right? And I, I, stored this, I stored this value in a ret val, so I can move this out. What do I do here? I'm throwing an argument, there's no ret val to return. Exactly, I mean, you're on the right track there. You sometimes have to do that, right? When you write a function and you want to do something common for multiple points, you just store a value that the various exit points would have create it and then return at the end. But I'm in trouble because I'm not returning a value here. But what conceptually, what do I want to say? Yeah. You want the return value to be an exception. So then I have two types of return values, right? But conceptually, I want Yes, it's, yes, yes. I want this action done, but that's, that's not quite. I want this action done before the method leaves. Right? Or I want some action done for all exit points of this try. That's what I really want, right? The try has three exit points. Each exit point, I want some common action done. Okay? And anybody seen this before in Java or... Finally, okay. You can say try, and then all these catches, and then say finally, do this. Which means before you return, please do this action. Okay. Like it? Make it cleaner, so you can have try, the try block a series of catch blocks and then finally a finally block okay questions all paths that lead from any try block end up in finally so finally executed after the try block and before the code following the try block so in this case we are returning but if we were not returning, we would, uh, we would just go to the next statement. Okay. Now, look at this function, factorial. Okay, if n is less than or equal to 1, return 1. Otherwise, return n star factorial n minus 1. Now, I put a method saying started factorial. I'd like to also put a statement saying ended factorial. And now we can use Ilona's method and say, you know, we can have a retval, store one in retval in one case, store one in retval in one case, and store n star factorial n minus one in retval the other case, other way, in other case, and return retval after printing out the message. Okay? So we can do what she was talking about. But that's still a little clumsy, right? I had to go and clear, create a variable, store, put in that variable this, this value. So can you imagine, given what we just learned, a way to solve the problem?
I want finally start, started function, uh, ended function to be printed. I can put, and this is cheating, I mean this is really, you know, it's not very clean, but they didn't want to invent a new syntax. There's no error occurring here. But I put this in a try block and saying all parts from the try block lead to finally. Like it? It's a very powerful tool. I really recommend this to you. Okay? It's, it's ugly because it's not an error prone statement. But you know, let's not invent yet another syntax keyword. And it's going to go in all parts from that. So even if in, in your try block or in if your catch block says you can have nested ifs with different parts leading out from the method. All parts lead to finally. Okay. Questions? Okay, just as I said earlier. And can you guys see this somehow connected, connecting to pre and post conditions? Or at least post conditions? Post conditions are conditions you establish after all paths from a method. That's the post condition of a method. If you want to assert post conditions, it becomes very ugly because you have to then make sure then you have to put that post condition somewhere where all plots can jump to. So I can just go and say assert preset weight and I can do I can I can then put finally a, I'm not sure this is the best example but basically you can put your post conditions in, in finally final blocks. Okay so so this is, this is oh, before I, I understood and knew about finally, I used to define another method that would call the first method and, the, and, and, the, and, and I would define an extra method that would just have the final clause. Okay? So if I wanted to know what happened to method P at the end, I would define a method Q that called P and then did some post condition after that. You don't have to do that extra method. Now you can just put a finally. Okay, so finally is extremely powerful too. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see how, how well we understand exceptions. I have a list whose first element is not a string and whose other two elements are strings. Okay. I'm going to make some error. I'm going to go through the list, list and cast each element to a, to a, to a string. Okay. So I'm going to get an error when I go and cast 5 as a string. In one case, I put the try catch inside the loop. In the other case, I put the try catch. I put the, I put the, I put the catch outside the loop. Okay, and in, in one case, I put the try inside the loop. And in one case, I put the loop inside the try. Now, we can debate as to which is better. Firstly, will the results in any way be different based on whether I do number one step yeah, Sam? Yeah, the first one will print hello and goodbye because it'll, even after the catch, it'll print something else, but then it'll keep running the for loop. It'll keep running the for loop. Or it's the second time, if it, any of the things in the string are wrong, it'll just crash. So what, what's the rule here? So what you're saying is that in this case, the moment the first string is found to be not casting correctly, it'll abandon the loop. So the rules here are that whenever an exception is thrown, it looks at the closest block and sees if there's a catch there or not. If there's a catch here, it goes to that catch. If that block doesn't have it, it goes to the catch in the surrounding block. And it keeps going to the surrounding blocks till it hits a method. If there's a catch, um, and then if, if, uh, then if the method doesn't have a catch, then it goes to the guy who called the method. If that guy doesn't have a catch, it goes to the, its caller till you finally get to the interpreter. Okay, so you want to catch it as early as possible in many situations. And in this case, we want to catch it right here rather than wait till later so that we can do more error recovery. Okay, so those are the rules. 
that exception, exceptions get caught by the most, by the, by the closest block that catches it. Okay, and by the way, uh, now the question is, which is which was the right thing? Should you just give up immediately, or should you give up later? And uh, you guys like alternative one or two? And and you guys, you know, don't quite know what this problem is doing. What about scanning errors and parsing errors? Would you want for scanning er errors alternative one or alternative two? One. Keep trying till you find all the illegal tokens. What about passing errors? If, yeah, if you missed one curly brace, you just confused the parser completely. Okay, so you want to probably quit immediately. You know, you guys don't have to deal with the situation because you have interactive programming environments where the moment you make the mistake, it tells you. But before these interactive programming environments existed. You had to run a compiler, and the compiler would go in after the first th three or four errors. Say, "I'm giving up because who knows what you've done, you know." So let's let's just correct those errors before I give you any more errors. And there was there was this person who came came to us from the writing center in our faculty meeting, and he says, "You know, when you're correcting people's papers for writing mistakes, after the first five grammar mistakes, just stop checking for grammar mistakes, okay? Because it just you know it's just going to be repetition." So uh, whether you do it here or there is an issue, it's a judgment call. Just as when we talked about whether this method should handle the exception or that method should handle the exception, should this block handle the exception or that block handle the exception, that's a judgment call, but you know the rules now. So. Okay? Okay. So in one case, uh, that statement is abandoned, and in this case, the whole block is abandoned. Okay, so print line terminated, ter terminated, catch executed, and loop continues. And you get a class cast exception, and you get hello and goodbye. And in this, in this case, print line terminated, and exception propagated to enclosing loop, which is also terminated, and catch executed. Okay, so you just get class cast exception, and you don't get, uh, you don't get the other two guys printed out. Okay? So independent errors can be collected, such as in scanning. Dependent errors, as in parsing, you can abandon. Okay. <coughs> okay. Questions. So we're doing exceptions, and uh, we've we've pretty much covered the language concepts that we will cover in this course, and it's going to be more uh, use of these concepts for the next few lectures. And um, but let's let's um, let's review a little bit uh, something that's tricky, which is checked exceptions. So we know that exceptions get thrown; they get caught. Um, that's all. Uh, so so that applies to all kinds of exceptions. And there are two kinds of exceptions: the checked exceptions and the non-checked exceptions. Okay. And with checked exceptions, if you don't catch an exception, you better go and document. Uh, in the method header, the fact that uh, you haven't caught it. Okay, so you must acknowledge it. And we've more or less seen the rules behind this, but let's try to understand them a little bit more in depth, depth uh, before we finish the discussion. So here's the rule, and here's an example to illustrate the rule. So we are doing a read line. A read line reads from the input. The input could be a file also. And the input could be terminated before you read the line you wanted to read. So if that happens, that's an error. That's a user error. And we get an IO exception for input output exception. Okay. And here, in this, in this method, the, the method that's uh, calling read line also catches the exception rather than let it propagate to its caller. Okay. So it's catching it. So it's not in the method header acknowledging the fact that it's, so it doesn't, nothing has to be acknowledged in the method header, okay? Because it's catching it. The other alternative is that it says, I'll just read line, hoping things go well. And if things don't go well, I let my caller handle it, okay? And my caller can just look at the header of the method 
and say, oh, the called method is not catching the exception, so I am responsible for doing it. So there is some coordination, uh, and, and one doesn't have to look at the long method body to analyze what's happening. Okay? That's checked exceptions. With unchecked exceptions, no such rules apply. You do an array index out of bounds, you can catch it, That's, that may be good, but if you don't catch it, you don't have to say throws. Okay? And we saw the rationale last time that the, uh, the exceptions that have to do with external conditions, conditions that are not under the control of a programmer, should be caught uh, and, and uh, sh should, be, uh, should be declared, and the other exceptions needn't be declared. Okay? Those are under the control of the programmer. If the programmer is good, they'll, they'll not even allow those exceptions to occur, so why burden them by saying that such an exception can be thrown, especially when they've made sure it, 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 it's not thrown. Okay? Here's a confusing thing. Okay, so what happens with checked exceptions? If you don't catch it, and you don't say throws, Java will give you an error. Okay? It'll say, sorry, this is a checked exception, hence you should go and, and hence there's an error. Okay, so those are the rules for checked exceptions. Okay? This is where it gets confusing. What you've done is you've caught the exception, yet you said you're throwing an exception. Okay, well, maybe it's confusing, maybe it's not confusing. What do you guys think Java should do at this point? Say fine or say that's an error? Okay, so there are four cases. You, um, you, you catch it and you don't say throws, okay? You um, don't catch it, you say throws, those are legal. You don't catch it, you don't say throws, that's illegal. You catch it and you say throws. Anybody who's used exceptions, would, have you seen anything like this before? And so the obvious thing is that Java should say it's an error. Right? Or is not? You're catching it. If you're catching it, there's no way this method is going to throw it. Okay, so, yeah, Jacob? Josh, Josh, Josh Quinn. Quinn, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you guys are sitting next to each other. <laughs> If the caller wanted to do something when the exception is thrown, but the trouble is that this called method is catching it. If it catches it, it doesn't get thrown. So, it's, so, so already you got confused here about this, right? So Java should really not allow it, right? There are only, only two cases. Either you're catching it, you're not catching it. Could if you're catching it, say throws. If you're not catching it, don't say throws. Could the catch statement then throw the same exception? The catch statement could throw the exception, but it's not doing it in this case. Yes, indeed it's possible to catch it and have it thrown, but the catch statement is not doing it. So this is certainly confusing. Now, if this is not, if this is not caught, if this error is not caught by Java, then the danger is that the, the caller will not catch it. Right? And it might go all the way to the interpreter. So we can see why Java will not allow this to happen. Because it's a checked exception. <coughs> What's the danger if Java allows this to happen? You, you caught it here. And the caller will be ready to catch it. Right? Any harm done? There's just some extra code there. It didn't get executed, but no. Uh, but but in terms of the error not being caught, that problem didn't occur. Okay. So Java will actually say, "That's fine. You want you know you want to say throws. No harm done. So I won't bother checking really if 
your body is consistent with what you're saying because no harm is done. You just have some extra code. Do you like that? Yes. If it's a checked exception, does that make another method that calls it have to handle it? Yeah, so it makes the other method that calls it have to handle it. So you're not very happy with that, are you? You wrote this extra code. No harm was done, except that you had to write this extra code. So why does Java do this? And uh, so this is just fine. Okay, this is why I said this, things get not confusing. Okay. So allowed as callers will still work, though it will have the extra handling. So Java doesn't care that you have to you type some extra things. Okay. But it has to be a little bit more fundamental. But let's go in, and let's just go and have a look at real life. So um, if you're driving a car and learning how to drive, and you put a little license, a little, little, little uh, uh, sign that, look, uh, I'm a new driver. People will slow down. People will watch out for you. So if you're a good driver, no harm done, right? Except people have to slow down, but at least no accident occurred. OK? The same kind of logic that Java is using. That you want to be extra careful, that's OK. Uh, there was no harm done. Okay? And we don't mind you typing extra. In some sense, Java versus Python, that's a difference. That Python says, oh, don't declare type, types of variables. We'll infer them. Whereas Java says, no, 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 declare the type just in case you use it wrong, wrongly. Okay? So Java is for a more verbose uh, expression. Okay? And similarly, with, 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 with um, medicines, if you go and you know, st overstate the side effects, nobody's going to sue you. Okay? So in real life, we do see such things that you're being conservative. Okay? So, um, you know, if, if, so if, if in general, if you do something bad and you turn out to be good, nobody's going to blame you. Okay? The other way around is an issue. Okay, you let some person down. So this all makes sense if there is some uncertainty. Okay, if, if you're really learning, but, you've, you know, uh, but you haven't quite learned, you might want to keep, the, keep, keep that uh, sign on. Okay? And uh, you don't want to just state side effects for the sake of stating side effects. You, there's <coughs> some loss there. Okay? So what is uncertainty? Well, we know in this case, by looking at the code, that an I.O. exception cannot be thrown. Okay? But it might have been thrown had there been some part here in the catch block, for instance, that threw an another exception. And Java, if it really wanted to, it could try to analyze your code and to figure out if an exception really is thrown or not. Okay? Now, I've talked about this such a problem before, that how hard do you think that problem is to go through code and see whether a particular exception is thrown or not? Impossible because did I did I did I talk of a similar problem before that's impossible? Halting the halting problem. The halting problem says we can't tell if the method will ever if the halt or not because of loops. You can't analyze loops and really know what's going on. And we see there's a loop here. This loop is easy to analyze. But in general, loops are not always possible to analyze. So so in this case there's no uncertainty. But in general, Java cannot tell if an exception throwing path is taken. Okay? That's one reason. Another reason is that your method body may evolve after your header is created. Okay? And in general, a good way of programming is this test first programming where you write the stuff. You just write the method headers first. You let check style be happy. And then you fill in the body, bodies to sort of get your, uh, get your code working. Okay, so to allow this kind of evolution, the method may evolve from stop to full implementation. So that's probably another reason why Java says that's okay. You know, you must have, the fact that you went and set throws IO exception after handling it, you must know what you're doing. That's what's really going on here. And, and we let you do it because you can do no harm. And there may be some good that, that we don't understand. Okay? So, um, so a uh, false false out in this case. And things get even more interesting when you go to interfaces. Okay? There, there was one method header associated with one method body. We could analyze that one method bo body and say whether the method header is consistent or not. But with interfaces, I can have one method header 
apply to multiple bodies. One body may catch, another body may not catch. Okay? So if you want to take the most conservative approach and say, you know, if, any, if there ever can be some method body that, 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 that throws, we should say throws. Okay? So... So that's the interface, and these are the classes, and they can be, uh, you know, one that throws exception of one kind, another that throws exception of another kind. If they both are checked exceptions, then the method header should go and acknowledge both exception one and exception two. Okay? So it's acknowledging the union of the exceptions of the method bodies rather than uh, uh, one method body. Okay? So in general. And similarly, with medicines, you may get dizzy, somebody else may not get dizzy. So in general, if any one person is going to get dizzy, we will go and say, hey, it may cause dizziness. Okay? Same idea that if any one implementation can throw an exception, we will throw an exception. We will say it throws an exception. Okay? Questions? Okay, let us try to use our knowledge of exceptions and understand the rule I just talked about with this example. Okay, uh, some of you, how many of you have used the iterator interface in Java? A few of you have. Some of you have even implemented it, right? Uh, so, in, in fact, when you guys use scanner.nextline, you were using an iterator interface, okay? So iterator interface says that you want a sequence of items and you're going telling, asking for next, next, next. And, and you also have a, have a has next method to say whether there is a next or not. Okay? And you might have seen iterator in the context of a, of, of a list. You might have seen iterator in the context of a scanner. And I'm right now doing a much simpler iterator interface. And what is, what is this iterator interface doing? Every time I do a next, what do I get? What is the name of my class? Okay, so you start off with A, and every time you say do next, you get the next character. Okay? And that's what this is saying. And if you're at the end, you say there is no more characters, no more letters. Okay? So that's what this particular um, implementation is doing. And what's going to happen here when you're at the last, supposing you've reached the last letter, and then you say next, what's going to happen? Um, it's just going to go to whatever. to whatever the character after Z is. You'll go to whatever the character after Z is. That's not what you want, right? It's an error. And I don't, this next is not catching that error. It's just assuming that error doesn't occur. Is that a reasonable assumption to make? If you were to write it, would you write it this way or would you be, more, would you be, what, what, what can you do to avoid this error? Use that boolean up there. You've got a boolean there. So there is a check. But my next method is not calling that check, right? Yeah. Should it? What do you guys think? Is there any reason to not call that? If the program is well behaved, whoever is using this class should call has next before calling next. That's, that's what you just said. There is a boolean there. 
this class is saying, I've got you has next. You should be calling has next. And if you're calling has next, I go and call has next. We are doing has next twice. We're being inefficient. So whoever is the careful programmer is being hurt by inefficiency. Who's not a careful programmer gets, gets a benefit. So it's, it's a trade-off, you know, whether you trust your callers or you don't trust your callers. You may have one implementation where you say, I trust my callers, and the callers will do has next before calling next. So this is the case. Okay, so, so my interface might be like this, next and has next, which is a carrot iterator. And the exception, the error is that you aren't, you aren't checking. And I might have another implementation that says, I don't trust my caller. So if it is, uh, if I'm not, if I don't have a next, I say no such element exception. Okay. And I'm also saying throws no such element exception because I'm throwing it. Okay. So that's another approach where you're not trusting your caller. Now, based on all this context, what do you think no such element exception should be? Checked or non-checked exception? Unchecked because someone using it well wouldn't ever throw it. Unchecked because somebody using, writing the program well will not, will not cause it to be thrown. Okay? So now we see that, you know, why there's checked and unchecked. Okay? So it should be unchecked. This particular implementation has decided to do a check because it, you know, it's just being extra careful. But in general, so good idea to throw this exception when no more elements so called or knows what has went wrong, even though it's inefficient. Checked or unchecked? Unchecked as most users expected to call has next. Okay, this is where we left off last time. I'm doing a problem two different ways. And let's go and put our, you know, designer hats on and say which code is better. What I'm doing here is going to the scanner and saying, give me the next line. And I keep asking for the next line till there is no next. Okay, there is no next line. And when there is a next line, I go and convert that into a number. That next line may not be a number. So I go and catch the number format exception and do something very simple-minded, like printing the stack trace. Okay. In one case, I ch do has next. And in the other case, I don't do has next. Okay. I catch the no such element exception, which the scanner does throw, by the way. I'm using the scanner. The scanner next line will throw no such element exception if there is no line to be read. That means if you reach the end of the input, you can be reading from a file, you can read, be reading from the input. So which code is better, the first one or the second one? In both cases, I keep going till there is no such element. Okay, so what you're doing is, you know the scanner.next line is doing has next, right? And I do nothing in that exception handler. So I don't go and pay the price of doing a next, or the pay the price of writing this piece of code. So this is like a neat, neat way of using exceptions. 
really shows, you know, it shows your knowledge of exceptions. Anybody want to argue for the first case? First case, first case is a lot more clear what's going on. It's a lot more, more clear what's going on. Uh, because you know that you terminate at has next. Okay, so you would have to, you'd, it'll take you a while to figure that out. Okay, anybody else want to argue for one way or the other? So what did I say when we talked about exceptions first? That the person who's not interested in lo and errors will look at only the try block. The person who's interested in errors looks at catch blocks also. So in this case, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Jordan. So what Jordan said is entirely correct. Even if, though you have full knowledge of Java, okay, you have to, you know, you 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 here don't understand. You don't didn't even bother to look at this because you're not supposed to look at the non-error case. And the fact that this catch block has got nothing in it is a bad sign. Okay, that means this was not really an error. Okay. This is, this is more efficient. This is more clear. Okay? And do you want efficiency to trump or clarity to trump? You know, that's, that's always... Dylan? Java efficiency. Java efficiency. It's hard to read Java anyway. <laughs> it's hard to read Java anyway. I, I'd argue clarity since the compiler is go probably going to make it more efficient than you could do anyway. Okay, so in general, that's a good philosophy. You know, um, a long time ago, when Java was just coming up, there was a professor here who did parallel computing, whose job was to make things fast. And he had a C++ program, and you can't get much faster than C, okay? Even if you, you know, unless you do assembly. And uh, he took the same application, coded it in Java, with all his garbage collection, and he coded it, and he's a parallel professor, you know, a parallel programming professor, he coded it in C and the Java implementation ran much faster. In general, you know, the compiler can be smarter than you, okay? Having said that, there's always a joke among compiler writers that if your program doesn't work, turn all the optimizations off, okay? Because, I mean, they're, they're just making guesses. And the halting problem always gets you in trouble anyway, okay? So, actually, if, you're, if you really care about efficiency, you don't touch Java, okay? You go and program in C or C++. And if you're saying Java is not clear with its no such element exception like words, wait till you see C. Okay, the language is one letter, the variables tend to be one letter too. Okay, so uh, I would argue that Java is actually as clear a language. You know, there's a language called COBOL that you guys might have heard of, where you wrote essays really, uh, and, and uh, that was verbose. I would say Java. And there's all this, it's, 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 you know, you can't argue this one way or the other, but I would say Java goes, you know, it's pretty express, expressive, okay? It just says there's so much going on that you have to understand catch, try, generics, you know, to really make, make use the libraries. And that's why, you know, we spent a whole sem semester and we've gone at a fast pace and we barely covered the essential things you need to be able to program in Java. Okay, so it's, it's a big language. For that set, the reason, it may not be very clear, but, uh, uh, but the same concepts when they become coded in a language become clearer than if they are done sort of in libraries. Okay, so James Gosling actually made it very clear when he first talked about exceptions that do clarity trumps over efficiency. Okay, so, so uh, less efficient extra check, better style. Okay, and we've always gone for better style. But if you want to do graphics, if you want to do efficiency, you want to do kernel programming, uh, you will go for efficiency, okay? And you really have to differentiate between expected and unexpected events. End of file, end of line is an expected event in this loop. This loop cannot terminate if there is no end of file, okay? So this event is not an unexpected event. It is an expected event. So we do want uh, to make that clear right here, okay? Questions? 
So better style trumps over FC. Okay, so that's our discussion on exceptions. So we are we're doing typed errors. Okay, again, those of you who are not doing the extra credit, uh, you can see we spend a lot of time on this. One can write easily. I don't know. I don't know what the exam is going to be, but I'm just saying one can easily write small questions that don't take much time to process, uh, but do exercise your knowledge easily in an exam. So um, do study this material well if you aren't doing the exceptions. And either way, study this material well. Okay. So you, the, you provide a way of doing customized error handling. Um, by default, Java will terminate program. Allows more efficient processing. Okay. Uh, because you let the ex when there's truly an error, not in the last case when there, there was not an error, you don't have to do an extra error check. You can just cast the error and next out of bound exception, and allow separation of error handling and normal processing code. That is one of the goals. That goal was violated in the previous slide when we tried to be efficient. Okay, and it and with propagation, the the error handling and the error detection code can be far away from each other which is good, separation of concerns. And the errors, and then the errors can be internal or external. And uh, in that, that's why we have checked and unchecked exceptions. And then there is sort of detailed semantics of what the try-catch means, that if the error is not caught in the immediate, uh, um, so basically you keep going up the nesting, up the scopes till you find a catch block. And then you, terminate the try statement corresponding to the catch. Okay, so where you put the catch determines how, how much you terminate. Okay, and when you have try and catch, when you have a try block, there can be, and tr when you have a try catch block, there can be multiple exit, po exit points. And all those exit points can be coalesced in through a finally block. Okay, so even when you don't have errors, it's useful to have a finally block if you're going to have more than one exit point from a try. Okay, so when you have try catch, you have multiple exit points from a try, and each catch can have multiple exit points. And all those exit points are united by the finally block. So that's a very powerful 